It's June 16th, Wednesday morning, a good Wednesday morning to you. This edition of Real Talk, just like every other edition of Real Talk, is presented by the team at Bitcoin Well, our proud title sponsors. We've been having some really great conversations about cryptocurrency lately, especially considering what's happening in El Salvador. Named official, it's legal tender down there. People are going, well, what does this mean for international markets? What does this mean for... Canada and the United States and and Western Europe and I'm just going to say what I've been saying the entire time if you have questions if it still makes little or no sense to you you're still trying to wrap your mind around the concept the team at Bitcoin well is there to to help to answer your questions to sit down with you to figure out a game plan if you're looking to dip your toes in the pool you'll find Bitcoin well right at the top of the sponsors page at ryanjesperson.com Real Talk starts right now. Here's Ryan Jesperson. Coming up in about 10 minutes on the show, Sarah Hoyles has has booked. uh, I'm really looking forward to this conversation. I hadn't heard about the lying flat trend. Have you heard about this movement out of China? Uh, Cheryl Tay will join us. Uh, She's going to check in from Singapore in about 10 minutes time. This is a piece that she's done. Uh, for the out of the insider Singapore Bureau, fascinating development uh, as Chinese youth by the thousands are starting to push back against this uh, a pretty onerous work culture, you might call it this this idea of like the nine nine six culture, and we'll learn more about what that's all about. It is it's pretty straightforward, as a matter of fact. The idea being, and I'm oversimplifying, but the idea being that you should work twelve hour days, six days a week, nine a.m. to nine p.m. six days a week. It's being it's it's been described culturally as a as a virtuous or honorable approach to take to work and political leadership in China, business leadership and the founder of Alibaba, which is, of course, one of the the biggest businesses, the biggest business entities in the world when it comes to e-commerce, et cetera. Think of Amazon. Very similar ish. Uh, Maybe maybe closer to eBay. Is it maybe closer to eBay than Amazon? Alibaba. I, I mean, I've never used it, but I would say I think I think you're onto something with the eBay. Uh, the, the thing about China, like businesses in China, a lot of times, like the, obviously a global superpower, mm. um, but a lot of North Americans will have little to no experience with with a lot of those businesses, or, or there's a lack of familiarity. China's got such a, uh, you know, such a sort of like you know, I mean, it, it's 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 its own entity when it comes to to global powers. Absolutely. I mean, looking at the G7, how they're they're trying to figure out, like, how do we manage this? How does yeah. how do, all the different countries saying, how, how are we going to manage China? But I mean, there was also Clinton who said, uh, Bill Clinton, that, you know, had said, we're not going to let this Internet thing get get away from us and we're not yeah. going to let China run this. Yeah. And then just like the U.S. is going to clamp down on crypto. Yeah. Exa- Similar thing. Exactly. Right? So there's a, this bubble that so China was like, OK, you're not going to let us do it. We'll create our own thing. Yeah. Thank you very much. And then Alibaba. Yeah, up. exactly. Yeah. I, I want to get started on Elizabeth Warren and her take on crypto, but I better not. It's 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 the one ground where Elizabeth Warren and Donald Trump have found common ground. Uh, but I digress. Okay. I digress. I'm looking forward to this conversation with uh, Cheryl Tay. That's coming up. The lying flat culture. Of course, it's it's interesting to see that these groups are popping up on Facebook. And you can imagine it would be the equivalent. Well, I'll ask Cheryl if I'm oversimplifying. But it would be the equivalent of you might have groups uh, here, let's say, in Canada of, of, of thousands of people that would come together and form a Facebook group called Kick Up Your Feet and Relax. Or the Long Weekend Group. Or Take a Day Off. Or get outdoors and take a deep breath. You know, walk your dog at 5 p.m., not 9. I mean, you know, these types of groups. But they're being censored and shut down you and betcha. canceled in China. So it's a, it's a big deal. But what does this mean when it comes to generational cultural change? And what might be the applications uh, around the world? Should be a great conversation. Again, that's coming up now in about six minutes time. We're going to talk to Dr. Trevor Toom, an economist out of the University of Calgary. A lot of talk about equalization right now. And it. It gives me an opportunity as well to pump the tires of our question of the week. This is our Real Talk question of the week in partnership with our friends at Y Station, the official research and strategy partners. If you go to RyanJesperson.com, our website, you're going to see right at the top of the page the question of the week. Uh, we're asking you to chime in on this one. There's there's a, a very good chance in the municipal elections this fall across the province of Alberta, the, the United Conservative government will put forward a referendum question 
asking you if you think the commitment, the federal government's commitment to equalization payments should be taken out of the Constitution. The idea being that Alberta has been getting the shaft. We ask you this week in our question of the week, the exact question that the provincial government is quite likely going to ask you. And so you click on the question, you dig in, and it's pretty easy to start. It'll literally take you two minutes. You get to the first question, and here it is. Should Section 36 of the Constitution Act, Parliament and the Government of Canada's commitment to the principle of making equalization payments be removed from the Constitution? And and then we get into it, and we have a a little bit of fun. and, and, And quite honestly, it gets a little cheeky, our question of the week. We're having some fun with it, but we also want to know seriously how our audience feels. I can tell you we have this thing called a dashboard. I don't mean to come across as too fancy, but we're able to drop in on our polling results through the course of the week and see where people are at. And I, I'm, I'm nervous to divulge this because I don't want to skew the results. But you're gonna. But I'm gonna. <laughs> Because I think if you tune in live each and every single morning or if you download our podcast later in the day and if you do it on a daily basis, you should have some sort of a some sort of a reward. Mm -hmm. I think that I think that you should be rewarded for your your loyalty here to Real Talk. I'm going to let you know one of the things that we've noticed early on by monitoring our dashboard. The yeses. Should Section 36 be removed from the Constitution? The yeses are higher than anticipated early in the process now it's only wednesday we kicked it off just yesterday just tuesday so we're one day in uh we've got about 500 uh, responses already and i haven't checked this morning to be quite honest so we may have more than that but we encourage you to answer our question of the week if you're one of those that's like hell yeah chime in if you're one of those going are you serious chime in dr trevor toom will get into that with us in uh what, about a half an hour's time or so. And then later in the program, we're going to talk to Katie German out of uh, Food Share Toronto. They're calling on, when they, want, when they see job postings, most specifically in nonprofits, but I think we'll broaden the conversation. When they see job postings, they want salaries posted with them. They say this is a way to address the gender wage gap and, and other issues, systemic issues, pervasive issues. You might describe them as, so we'll get into that with Katie, why she thinks that's a good move. Also keeping our eye on some of the stories making news when it comes to federal politics. Annamie Paul, the leader of the Greens, literally like hours after she sat down with us for an extended interview. What was that? About 45 minutes or something, I think she was with us. It was a great interview. I think it was more like an hour. Was It was close to an hour. You were just shit. Well, we were, we were kind of, we we you know, getting along quite well, and yep. she was being quite candid. And, you know, it was we had, great. We asked her live, do you have to go? She's like, eh, I don't think so. We were like, all right. So we kept going. Anyway, so it's like hours later, all hell breaks loose within the Greens. And one of her senior advisors, you know, this guy by the name of Noah Zatman, it comes out that this guy's been been a bit of a well, he's been a bit of a shit disturber within the Greens caucus. To be honest, as a matter of fact, it appears as though comments made by Mister Zatwin directly prompted one of the Greens' only MPs out of Fredericton, Jenica Atwin, to defect to cross the floor to the Liberals. So Zatman's on his way out. Anime Paul narrowly misses a vote on her leadership last night. I mean, this is days after she talked to us. I'm. Again, at risk of oversimplifying, what this comes down to is, is some of the strife, some of the, the pulls and the tension that's existed within the party when it comes to the conflict, Israel, Palestine, and positions that Green Party loyalists and MPs have taken on this. And I mean, Paul's tried to sort of, I think, stand in the, in the middle and, and say, hey, listen, you know, she condemns violence, you know, rocket strikes against Israel. She condemns violence, rocket strikes and discriminate against Palestine. MPs are saying we stand in solidarity with Palestine. And Noah Zatman said that we will defeat you and, and we will support, continue to support Zionists. And so now, I mean, you remember I talked to Ms. Paul when she was on the show. One of the fascinating things about the dynamic or the makeup of the Green Party, of course, is that it'll attract the hard left and it will attract the hard right. That's one of the interesting things about the Green Party. And so you see here now, when those, when those intersect on issues, especially combustible ones, that's exactly what can happen. MP out of Nunavut, Mumalak Kakak, has, has also captured the attention of the country in a farewell speech to the House of Commons. And we're going to play that for you in the next little bit. 
I want to make sure that we respect Cheryl Tay's time chiming in from Singapore. Sam, are we ready to rock on that one with Cheryl Tay yet? No, we, okay. we don't have her Well, this yet. is perfect. So when, when she checks in, you let me know. In the meantime, let me bring you this. Now, typically on a talk show, I mean, on the evening news, you're, you're going to get a clip. They'll call it a quote from a newsmaker, from somebody that's talking, whether it's the lady that saw the, the tornado tear through and the tree went through the window of the house or whether it's a politician describing why they voted a certain way, you hear about 15 or 20 seconds. We're not going to roll that way today. I want to bring you about three and a half minutes of this member of parliament's farewell speech. She's not seeking reelection. An MP out of Nunavut, I think that has inspired people for through the course of her tenure in Ottawa. But as she revealed yesterday afternoon, there are reasons, deep-seated reasons, why at least for now, She's choosing to walk away. Here is the MP out of none of it, a portion of her so-called farewell speech. This is Mumalak Kakak. Nunavut. Matna. Mr. Speaker, every time I walk onto House of Common Grounds, speak in these chambers, I'm reminded every step of the way I don't belong here. I have never felt safe or protected in my position, especially within the House of Commons. Often having pep talks with myself in the elevator or taking a moment in the bathroom stall to maintain my composure. When I walk through these doors, not only am I reminded of the clear colonial house on fire I am willingly walking into, I am already in survival mode. Since being elected, I expect to be stopped by security at my workplace. I've had security jog after me down hallways, nearly put their hands on me and racial profile me as a member of parliament. I know what to do in these situations. My life in Canada, and especially through this experience, has taught me many things. As a brown woman, do not move too quickly or suddenly. Do not raise your voice. Do not make a scene, maintain eye contact, and don't hide your hands. Every Inuk has survival mode. We have to. No, not two generations ago, survival mode meant endurance of extreme temperatures and finding food throughout the winter. Now survival mode means being able to see that warmth in shelter and affordability in livelihood but being denied it at the hands of the federal government. The federal institution needs to change its own policies and procedures to reflect reflect reality instead of creating barriers for people like me. I shouldn't be afraid of going into work. No one should be afraid of going into work. It is possible to create change. It can be started here in the House of Commons and reflected in Canada. There is a refusal and unwillingness for change, not an an inability to accomplish it. People don't like me don't belong here in the federal institution. I'm a human being who wants to use this institution to help people, but the reality is that this institution and the country has been created off the backs, trauma and displacement of indigenous people. Even if we're told we should run, we still face huge barriers. Young people have been told they are not experienced enough, not ready to lead. Women have been told to sit pretty and listen. Disabled individuals have been shown they aren't even worth the conversations and Inuit kill themselves at the highest rate in the country. We are facing a suicide epidemic and this institution refuses to care. During my time in this chamber, I have heard so many pretty words like reconciliation, diversity, and inclusion. I have been called courageous, brave, and strong by people outside of my party. But let me be honest, brutally honest, nice words with no action hurt when they are uttered by those with power over the federal institution and refuse to take action. That's a portion, that's about three and a half minutes of uh, the MP out of Nunavut, the Honorable Member Mumalak Kakak, delivering her farewell speech 
in the House of Commons. Uh, it's about 10 minutes. I encourage you to check it out yourself in its entirety. She says a couple of times, I don't belong here. And then she goes on to 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 a, a, a sort of a, a, a bit of a demure smile, a subtle smile crosses her face and she indicates her desire to see more. She says young or Inuk or women or all here on the hill. She thanks the leadership of her party for hearing her out. She thanks some of her fellow MPs for their support. We can't help but feel that this is an incredible loss uh, when it comes to the federal political landscape, but you listen to these incredibly personal insights. You also get the sense that she's speaking on behalf of an entire people. Powerful stuff. Linda Ray on our live chat calls it devastating. Nicole says it's incredible but heartbreaking. Fatima says incredibly powerful. Everybody needs to watch it in its entirety. Kim says how disappointing her trauma and sadness palpable. So you're feeling what what I was feeling when I first watched it. Some random guy says, you know, it's so depressing to see idealistic and hopeful young people get crushed, get thrown aside by the system they were hoping to change from within. Donna says she does belong there and many more people like her belong there. That's right, Donna. Tawny says we need more people like her in government. It's so frustrating that she feels like she's being pulled out. Heidi says she is a total badass. It's too bad the system drove her out. The viewer says, why don't we have better politicians? Then we realize our system inherently destroys, destroys and jades those better politicians. I'm curious to know what you think about this. Obviously, we're going to endeavor to speak with her. We hope to have her on the show these are the types of conversations that we need to have. What is it that's driving people from politics? People who have been perpetually underrepresented and, as she lays out, exploited. And how can we feel that Canadians have a voice, especially right now, with what we're feeling as a nation, this, this sadness. I like that word palpable. You can feel it, the sadness I drove past the house of worship in Calgary over the weekend as I was on my way back up into town. Big, big house of worship. And had orange streamers all down the sides of its walls, all cascading down from the roof, all across one of the big exterior walls of the church. And I thought to myself, well, that's a start. That's a start. It's an acknowledgement. It's a start. We got a message from Michael yesterday, a real talker, and he said his little guy, Gabriel, we're driving around town. He says, he says, Gabriel and I just drove past 215 markers outside a school near our house. And Gabriel, just a little guy, asked what the hearts were for. And I said, it's because some children died. And we just found out about it. And Michael says, and then I caught myself and I said, some of us just found out about it. And Michael says, and that changes directly because of conversations that we're having on Real Talk and what your guests have brought to the table from Michael. We've been getting a lot of messages about reconciliation. We've been getting a lot of messages about Canada's history. and, And we asked you that question by way of one of my unscientific, unofficial Twitter polls about how you're approaching Canada Day this year, whether or not you intend to cancel Canada Day, whether or not you have mixed feelings about it. And they were interesting results. You can scroll back on my Twitter profile at Ryan Jesperson if you'd like to see them. But it was approximately one in five respondents said they're going to cancel Canada Day this year, about 20%. But 35, 40% of you, if I remember correctly off the top of my head, said, acknowledge that you have mixed feelings, that it's complicated for you this year. Tanya wrote in to say that, you know, I've been restless lately, especially after listening to Real Talk. The question of, like, what on earth is going on with these legal challenges? You know, we hear that the the federal government is fighting indigenous people, in particular indivi- uh, indigenous uh, children, in court. And you remember the unanimous non you know, the unanimous vote in the House of Commons, that non-binding motion imploring the federal government to drop its legal challenges. 
around children in care. And there are several challenges, and, and it runs deep, the implications. You remember the prime ministers skipped the vote. Senior liberal cabinet ministers skipped the vote. We asked Minister Seamus O'Regan about it on Friday. Tanya says, you know, our current government, this federal liberal government made a lot of promises. And for sure, when you when you set your expectations high, you will disappoint a lot of people. But I don't and I can't believe that the vast majority of members of parliament, liberals included, are racist, hateful people who want to deny victims compensation or who want to deny indigenous children proper funding. So then why persist with the court challenges? She says the optics suck. And they're not in alignment with public sentiment or their stated goals. The why is weighing heavily on me. She says, so I reached out to my lawyer brother. He calls me for medical stuff. I call him for legal stuff. And his response was framed in the language of jurisdiction. Who gets to decide as a victim and who gets to determine compensation? Tanya says, so pursuing that angle a bit further, I've been reading that the crux of this issue is about the Human Rights Tribunal and what authority they have to make these determinations. And as a Ukrainian Canadian, Tanya says that that's where my light bulb went on. You know, hours after the news that the federal government would provide funds for for searches, investigations at other sites of former residential schools. I got an email from the Ukrainian Civil Liberties Association outlining their advocacy to get similar funding to search former internment camp sites. They have decades of advocacy under their belts for reparations from those camps. Advocacy often about opportunity, says Tanya. She says there are decades and decades of horrific behavior of the Canadian government, different parties represented toward all kinds of groups, generally minorities, indigenous people, Ukrainians, the Japanese, the Chinese, Vietnamese, LGBTQ2S plus people, and so many others. So how these groups are compensated, how reparations are dealt with, how traumas are healed, it's huge. It's overwhelming. She says, I can appreciate the need for clarity at some level of how these decisions happen and who gets to make them. She says, but I sure hope I don't come across like I'm making excuses. I'm not happy with the status quo. She says, but I'm asking you, Ryan, and your team to help us learn more about this. She says, I have to believe this is a conversation worth learning more about. Finding the right voices, the expert voices to help us understand this better would be greatly appreciated. Thank you, as always, she says, for the challenge to think and learn. That from Tanya. Beautifully said and incredible. We know that many of us will continue to wrestle with these. I think that. I mean, everybody sort of candidly or colloquially and respectfully refers to the the honorable member out of Nunavut as Mumalak. Mm -hmm. That's how everybody refers to her. And and I'll be interested to see. I mean, this was just late yesterday afternoon. I'm interested to see how this will will resonate with people because it hits on a number of fronts. Right. It hits on the front of of reconciliation, how indigenous people, Inuk people have been uh, treated, exploited, colonized. I mean, she discusses this in, in the full 10 and a half minute address. It's also bigger picture in the sense of this is a young, talented, articulate, whip smart woman, a minority, a visible minority who's walking away, who's saying it's not for me. I don't feel safe here. She says she's been racially profiled by security on the hill and she's out. And I can't help but think that You don't have to be Inuk or you don't have to be indigenous to feel as though this is a great loss. Absolutely. I, I would have to agree with you a hundred percent on this one, Ryan. Um, I mean, when you, what I took away, what I heard in that was that, you know, the system was built, you know, when people are like, Oh, the system is broken. It's like, no, but it's how the system was built. It, It was not built to be inclusive of a variety of voices. It was built for <laughs> old white guys. Mm. <laughs> That's who it was built for. So not uh, so for her not to feel welcome, that is um, a byproduct of how the system was built. And so, I mean, a part of me is like, well then, you know, what's the point? We're, we're, we're at a loss. Like there's, there's nothing that can be done. But um, I think by her raising her voice and speaking, you know, truth to power. I think that that is, I mean, it's pulling, it's pulling back. 
it, it, yeah, it's pulling back the curtains and it's showing people what's really what's really happening. And that's like the 215. And now, I mean, looking at the numbers, how they're just they keep going up. We're more than 500 uh, children now found across Canada. So um, and that's the thing. We keep talking about the 215. We, I mean, this is what we need to take on and, mm. and we'll show leadership and responsibility here that when you say the 215 you refer to you know it's like in the united states if they talk about december 6 or if they talk about september 11th or there are these 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 dates or these numbers yeah that will come out and the 215 is is this discovery in kamloops you know where 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 you know canadians were forced um to take stock or force to confront this this history in a way that that for whatever reason the Truth and Reconciliation Commission's report didn't seem to do. It's not a shot against the report, that's for sure. Yeah, that's just a fact. And people are writing in and saying, "I don't know why it didn't grab my attention before, but it sure grabs it now." I wonder if it's because when maybe when you take a look at the scope or the scale of such an enormous issue. You know, sometimes it's hard to process when it becomes unignorable, like it's one small thing. I can't think of a good example, but, but you know, if, if you're starting to hear about rates of infection during a pandemic or something like that, or, you know, a thousand people have this or 1,400 new cases here or 600 people in, in ICU or something like that. These are not current numbers, by the way. It's a little bit different than when, when somebody you know when somebody in your household starts to show symptoms or something, maybe something becomes more personal. Maybe it's because people could, I don't know, people were near Kamloops or people have driven past that school before. Or people I, recognize, I mean, when, when you look at a number like they've, they've estimated 4,100, I think the official number is actually well below 4,000 of, of children, indigenous children, you know, that died in care, in care, can't use the word care, yeah, that words. died away from their families, <laughs> yeah. right? They died after they were taken from their families. Uh, but but when you start looking at here's one school, there's an unmarked, undocumented grave with at one school with at least 215 kids in it. That's one spot. Maybe it becomes less of a, you know, it's like trying to understand the whole the, 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 the entire enormity of the ocean or the universe as opposed to narrowing down your focus at which point you can start to process it. I don't know. I don't know why it was different with Kamloops. I think all of those things, but something that I've been kind of like rolling over in my brain a lot is the pandemic and how it's really, you know, it's stripped away a lot of our distraction. So we have, we don't have all of our hobbies. We don't have all of our social engagements. We don't have this, that, and the other thing and having to take the kids here and having to do this over here and having to get to this work meeting. It's, it's kind of cut away a lot of distraction and it's, allowed us and I mean us is like the big us the the royal we um to look at ourselves and that so that's why I feel like George Floyd and Black Lives Matter and even this talking around the Palestinian uh Israeli crisis uh residential schools and people we we don't have the distractions we're actually we have we're having to we can't look away now. I, and so is it, un, it unfortunate? I feel like words are just I know. so. I know. But it's good because we're, you know, we're people are being forced to make intention to speak with intent. Mm. All right. Mm -hmm. I feel like that's kind of the maybe that's, that's part of the show. We, we promise to you, our valued audience, that will make things uncomfortable every once in a while. And sometimes it feels like we're making it uncomfortable all the time, which is great. Because we talk about status quo and whether or not we're fine with it and how could you possibly be. But it's it, we have every single story that we talk about. You choose your language carefully, which is a good thing. When you talk about Palestine and Israel, what are you going to call it? The conflict? Does that, does that word really fit? When you're going to talk about Canada's history with indigenous people, what's the word you're going to use there? I mean, aside from cultural genocide. And then you'll have people push back on that. Although those voices are getting more and more and more quiet the pushback against genocide you know the only people real really still pushing back on it are, are those that are writing alberta's social studies curriculum but fewer and fewer people judy says like listen to your words ryan burial sites at a school school graveyards 100 percent, judy so i read you a portion of that email 
a while ago, the guy the guy wrote in. He didn't like that I was calling him mass graves. He said he said in my world we call them cemeteries. How many elementary schools do you know that have a cemetery out back with two hundred and fifteen bodies and no gravestones? I sometimes wonder. I mean, I invite emails from everybody, but sometimes I wonder how in the hell do you hit send on an email like that? Some folks will go down swinging. I know that you know we have we've not walked a mile in Mumalak Kakak's shoes, and so you know people have different opinions on this, and and you're not necessarily wrong. I understand where where people are coming from, you know, to a certain degree. Some of you are saying, you know, it's really unfortunate that that you know she has to leave. It, you know, Erica says I sympathize with her situation, but once you leave, you can no longer promote change from within. We need voices like hers in government, not out of government. Sure, in theory, I agree. She's also a human being. She's describing how she doesn't feel safe in her workplace. She's describing how she feels ignored. She's talking about how people of power have the power and do nothing with it, how the institution is pretty difficult to rock. So I'd find it hard to believe that she's the type of person that's just going to walk away and that's it. We'll never hear from her again. There are incredible opportunities for advocacy for community contribution at various levels. And, and and I would expect that this is an individual that will continue to do incredible things. But, the you know, the, the spirit of what Erica is saying, you know, I don't want to come across as somebody that says, hey, listen, I, I feel abused and unsafe in my workplace. And you say, come on, tough it out. We need you in there. That's that's not the approach. That's not the response. But at the same time, Erica's right. It is important to have change makers, to have shit disturbers in government or in opposition that's extremely important at every level but i i think what we need to acknowledge is i'm sure that she i mean i wasn't in there i wasn't in the rooms i wasn't in the hallways but i i would assume <laughs> assume sarah what does assume do uh makes an ass out of you and me but um i would i would think that she would have worked hard within the system oh yeah it's not that she just was like this one time was like, you know, no, this is like there was obviously like cumulative um, effects and impacts that were eventually to the point where she's like, you know what? I can't anymore. And what is the cost? Yeah. What is the personal cost? I mean, being a whistleblower is not easy. Being somebody that is a shit disturber is not you are not welcome when you do when someone does that. It is not you are not heralded and welcomed when you are a whistleblower. It is ex- you are an enemy mm. of the status quo. So it's it takes a personal toll and it it's exhausting. And I, I just I don't think that it necessarily. I mean, I just I I am compassionate and I'm. I'm yeah, I just I feel for her. The watcher says just just say genocide it says culture is included. Let's call it genocide. Others, I mean, you know, Terry says, you know, some clarification about, you know, children in care in terms of child and family services or child family services. That term covers all kids, all children receiving services. So children can be, quote, in care while at home or living with family. Wigwith says we're built on a house of cards. Maybe it's time for a new deck. Others are saying I'm so disappointed by every party in the federal government for perpetuating this. Heidi says, Heidi's keeping track, says between all these locations they've searched at residential schools, former schools, it's now 572. Wally says, look at the United States. Everybody thought Joe Biden was the change because he was a Democrat and he wasn't Trump. And now look, he's done nothing. Yeah, we'll see. I mean, give Biden his four years, but we'll see. People oftentimes find that politicians that make promises on the campaign trail Oftentimes, once they achieve office, adopt a bit of a different perspective. And, uh, you know, there's a reason why I think there's a certain stigma or a reputation or a stereotype about political institutions. Because oftentimes they do hold steadfast in the face of winds of change. But that doesn't mean those winds should stop blowing. Share this video of Mumalak. Tell your friends about it. Wrestle with what she's saying. 
and try to consider what you can do in your neck of the woods, whether that's supporting somebody that's running for school trustee or supporting somebody that's running for city council or an MLA, maybe somebody that's considering a run at a federal seat. Even people that are asking how they can get involved, offering to, I mean, everything in the course of the pandemic, when you talk about campaigning, you have to issue caveats on all of it. I'm going to say knock on doors and things like that. But, you know, within reason, people that want to get involved and get engaged and plant those seeds and understand how change can happen because it can, but it can be slow and it can be frustrating. It can be infuriating. Always curious for your thoughts to talk at RyanJesperson.com. Cheryl Tay is uh, going to check in with us down the road. We look forward to chatting with her from Singapore. Potentially a technical issue. We're not quite sure, but we'll rebook her because I want to talk about this lying flat trend in China. Really interesting stuff. We'll talk about equalization with Dr. Trevor Toom in just a moment. Every Wednesday... This is the perfect way to split up our week. In partnership with our friends at Tourism Jasper, we dive into my Jasper memories. This is our way of celebrating Jasper National Park. Of course, I think I can say without any controversy, one of the most beautiful pockets of this great land. And and today... We're going to celebrate and touch on the history of rafting in the area. You know, before Highway 16, before the Yellowhead came through there, before the the Icefields Parkway 93, the fastest and for a while the only thoroughfare in and out of Jasper was the Athabasca River. From its source at the Columbia Icefield, it flows swiftly through Jasper National Park on its way to the Arctic Ocean. And for a long time, the Athabasca River was a lifeline for the region's uh, First Nations communities. As a matter of fact, the river's name comes from an anglicized Cree word, meaning grass or reeds here and there. The fur trade brought more water traffic through Jasper, and eventually, many years down the line, of course, it became a hub for whitewater rafters. I've been out there myself. It is a wonderful experience. Your jaw just drops the entire time that you're out there. Canada's first whitewater rafting outfitter, as a matter of fact, opened in Jasper in 1984, coming up on 40 years ago. And today there's four different rafting companies in Jasper that'll take you on multiple rivers, you know, gentle floats, if that's your thing, all, all the way through to the adrenaline pump thrill rides down turbulent rapids. If you've not experienced that and, and you have a bit of a stomach for it, you just have to do it. If you love to bring your dogs out to Jasper, they even have Jasper Raft Tours, which will specifically offer dog-friendly tours. Sarah Hoyles, your jaw is dropping along with everybody else's, realizing now that your pup can come with you whitewater rafting. Well, that's why you get a dog, so you can go on adventures with him. Your dog's not a swimmer, is he? Or is he? He's, We're trying. You're trying. We're- Our lab, Monroe, is a fabulous swimmer. Our boxer, Moses, not so much. Yeah. Exactly. We've tried life jackets. We've tried treats. We've tried everything. And Ranger just does not. He loves the water. He's willing to wade. Yeah. So maybe the raft. Maybe Moses the- is like the Moses is like the guy on the beach with like enormous pecs, <laughs> huge shoulders, lats, biceps, and water wings. Aww. Only goes into his ankles. So cute. That's Moses. Meantime, and Rose like swimming across the entire lake. So maybe the white water raft would be the way to go. That might be it. That might be it. He gets a little doggy life jacket, I bet, the whole nine yards. They've got all the COVID-19 safety measures in place, and you can learn more, plus view past features at jasper.travel slash real talk. That's where you can learn more about my Jasper memories. And we invite you every single week to send us your Jasper memories. Just hashtag my Jasper and real talk RJ every week. We have audience members sending in their Jasper memories. We absolutely love them. We picked Roberts for this week to feature. This is Robert. He says, is all that talk about Jasper on the show, he says, it takes me back to a trip we took as a family, the, uh, that boat, Ryan, that you were talking about on the on the Moline Lake, the, the Moline Lake tour. He says, so we're, we're eating lunch in town. Long story short, we realize we're running late, so we're scrambling to get there. It was my wife's birthday gift. So he says, there's no way we weren't making that boat. 
First of all, he says, I was supposed to be at Moline Lake. I wound up at Medicine Lake. Strike one. He says, he says, number two, we come roaring into the parking lot. He says, I've never been more proud of my parking job. He says, imagine Ace Ventura, pet detective, like a glove. Robert just comes screeching in. I'm sure obeying all safety protocols and speed limits. He says, then the kids have to pee. So I'm trying to hide, trying to shield them. They're peeing in front of the car in the parking lot. We're scrambling. We're running down to the boat. I'm yelling, hold the boat, hold the boat. And they say, let me guess, Robert. He says, yeah, he says, they almost left without you. He says, it was my wife's birthday. He says, I'm happy to report we're heading back to Jasper in early July. And he says, based on my Jasper memories on Real Talk, we've added into our itinerary the fireside chat with the warrior women. That's what Robert and his family are doing in the spirit of reconciliation. He says, thanks to that highlight on Real Talk. That's what we're doing in July. Robert, thanks for this. You can send us your Jasper memories, Instagram, Twitter. Of course, you can send us an email too to talk at ryanjesperson.com. Just hashtag my Jasper and Real Talk RJ. Well, how much do you actually know about equalization? How much do you actually know about the way that your income taxes go to Ottawa and how, how much you actually know about the, the way that the federal government disperses money around the province to ensure that there are, at least under a certain context or to a certain degree, equitable services from coast to coast to coast. As mentioned, Albertans will be asked, most likely this fall, by way of a referendum, whether or not they think that the federal government should drop its approach, its formula, essentially, for equalization. Dr. Trevor Toome has been making sense of this for folks like you and I for years now. As a matter of fact, back a couple of years ago, he wrote the piece Misplaced Anger, Western Alienation and the Battle Over Equalization. And, and I think it's safe to suggest, as we welcome the economist out of the University of Calgary, that the arguments still hold true. Dr. Toome, welcome to the show. Am I, am I right in assuming that? Has anything changed in the last couple of years with regards to equalization? No, I don't think anything has fundamentally changed since that article came out now, I guess, about two years ago, uh, which feels like forever these days. But so while some of the numbers might change here and there, the broad strokes of what was written about in that piece hold very true today. And really, that's that frustration in lots of provinces about federal policy is entirely normal. Canada is a very diverse country where federal policies will very naturally benefit some regions more than others. And that's really hard to uh, avoid. And so in lots of provinces, you have this kind of tension between uh, provincial identity and federal policy. But in Alberta, the concerns around equalization are largely uh, misplaced, which was the main argument in that piece. We're concerned about paying more to the federal government and not receiving equalization during our past recession, for example. But that's really just comes down to our having higher incomes, a younger population, a stronger economy, and therefore then naturally pay more in federal taxes than lower income regions like the, the Maritimes. So, so it's basically, let, let, let me put it this way in layperson's terms and correct me at any point, but if, if you're making, you know, whatever, X amount, let's say you're making a hundred grand and let's say your tax rate is 35%. I don't know exactly. So you pay, you know, 35% of that 100 grand to Ottawa. Then Ottawa has all this money, the revenue coming from, from the incomes of, of Canadians across the country. And then they have the have provinces and the have not provinces, right? Based on an economic formula of, of you know, all types of things that we don't need to get into the weeds on, but either provinces that are doing all right or provinces that aren't doing so well. And then Ottawa sort of props them up so the high tide lifts all boats and they can have things like education and health care and everything else. And of course, some provinces whose revenues aren't as high or where, whose citizens aren't making as much money are receiving more from Ottawa than those provinces where people are relatively flush. That doesn't mean that Alberta's writing checks to Quebec for Quebec's daycare programs, though, right? That, that's absolutely right. So that's the intent of the program. And so let's turn to Section 36.2 of the Constitution that the referendum is asking Albertans whether they want to eliminate or not. And this essentially says that Parliament and the Government of Canada is committed to the principle uh, to ensure that provincial governments have sufficient revenues to provide quote, reasonably comparable levels of public services at reasonably comparable levels of taxation. And if your PEI, where average family incomes are about $69,000 in the latest data, uh, a point of income taxes, 
there will raise less for their provincial government than that same point in, Al in Alberta, where average family incomes are nearly $100,000. And so those differences in economic strength means that naturally provincial governments and lower income regions raise less. So then the feds help top up below average provinces up to a national average level. And you're right to highlight that it's not Alberta writing a check to uh, the rest of the country. Uh, I'll quote former Conservative Federal Finance Minister Jim Flaherty here explaining this uh, very point uh, a decade and a half ago that at the end of the day, equalization is a federal program paid for by the resources that flow to the government of Canada from taxpayers in Canada paying Canadian taxes. There are no transfers between provinces through equalization. What do you think, who, who, who is most guilty or most responsible for Canadians misunderstanding equalization? Is it a problem? <laughs> is it a problem with high school teachers? Is it a problem with politicians? Or is it a problem somewhere else? So uh, I'd say that, well, first, it, like many policies, is not itself um simple once you start to dive into the weeds. The, the concept is pretty simple. We're helping lower income regions, uh, get th getting them up to a national average level. So the concept is pretty simple, but once you start talking about the design details of the formula, then it can quickly become fairly complex. And that means that there's scope for misunderstanding, but that's not unique to uh, equalization. Lots of policy suffers from uh, misunderstanding. And, and yeah, politicians, I, I do put a lot of blame on politicians for actively misrepresenting the program. It's one thing to, uh, you know, get the details wrong or, or slip up here and there. And that's, that's totally fair enough. But to repeatedly and consistently highlight um, misleading statements about the program that's a problem. And I think a couple come up that I hear in Alberta quite frequently. First is that Alberta has a very large provincial budget deficit. And we and we have been dealing with that now for a number of years. And so many will point to that to say, why don't we get equalization where Quebec, who has a surplus, does receive it. And I, I find that very misleading because the equalization program is not meant to fill in budget deficits. It's meant to support provinces that have weaker than average levels of economic activity and income. And Quebec has a surplus largely because its tax rates are roughly double uh, what we have in Alberta. So if, if we want to enjoy the Quebec surpluses and public services that, that they do, we can increase taxes in Alberta. We shouldn't turn to Ottawa to fill in the fiscal gap that we ourselves created. So that, that's one big um, regularly raised misleading issue in, in Alberta, and that's entirely at the feet of uh, politicians. Well, it's really easy, though, in Alberta to, to, gain, to gain political favor or build political momentum simply by invoking the word Quebec, let alone anything about Quebec. So it works, but it serves to distract, and I think that it, it serves to, to swerve people or steer people away from a fulsome understanding of the way that this works, which, of course, will then tweak the way that people are going to approach it, which, of course, will impact any referendum vote, which we'll get into in a little bit. What's another misconception that you hear in Alberta? That's a big one. You talk about budget deficits and how it all works. What's another one? So an, another one is uh, an issue that we talked about before, that Alberta is literally writing a check through equalization to other provinces. But as we noted, this is just a federal program, and there's no direct connection between equalization payments made to other provinces and Alberta's fiscal situation uh, at all. So that's another one that comes up uh, fairly frequently. Uh, a third that I think motivates a lot of recent suggestions by Premier Kenny and others to remove resource revenues from the equalization formula. So that's basically the only specific recommendation that uh, was put forward by the UCP in their platform in the last election. Uh, this kind of plays on the idea that equalization takes a share of resource revenues uh, somehow, or that including resource revenues in the equalization formula means that Alberta receives less uh, in terms of resource revenues, but that's not true either. No provincial revenue source is shared with other provinces. This, this comes straight out of the federal budget. And so the same pool of money that buys paper clips and office supplies and fighter jets pays for equalization. It's just federal general revenue.
Uh, Trevor, one of the you know one of the things that you'll hear from from folks that'll chirp Alberta's premier uh, when he talks about equalization, when he talks about Ottawa's unfair treatment of Alberta, uh, his perception, not mine. They'll say, "Hey, listen, uh, Premier Kenny, you are a senior cabinet minister under Prime Minister Stephen Harper when this equalization formula was was devised and developed. So there's uh, virtually zero credibility here." to complain about it. And I suspect the premier would say, well, things have changed and the landscape is different and it demands revisiting. You think that's a credible approach? I mean, how, how do you perceive the role that Jason Kenney, Stephen Harper and others have played in Canada's current equalization formula? Well, I interestingly, if we turn the clock back to uh, the final years of prime minister, uh, Sorry, I'm drawing a blank. Paul Harp, Martin. Martin. Yeah. They, they set up uh, an expert panel to look into the equalization formula and recommend changes to it. And that panel was actually chaired by uh, a, a real expert Albertan, Al O'Brien, who was a, a longstanding public servant here in the government of Alberta and deputy treasurer at the time. And so it was this panel that completed its work and made its recommendations after that election that led to the conservative victory and prime minister Stephen Harper. And so you have a panel appointed by a liberal government reporting to a conservative government led by an Albertan uh, and Stephen Harper largely adopted the recommendations of that panel. So not only was the formula that we have today largely um, implemented by a conservative party led by a prime minister from Alberta, but the formula itself was basically designed by an Albertan. And so in that sense, uh, it's not a formula that is in intrinsically unfair to the province, not at all. It was a principles-based, formula-driven approach to equalization that Harper at the time called a very fair approach because it treated provinces equally. Now, to the point that times have changed, yeah, Canada today, post-COVID, is certainly very different than Canada around the financial crisis and, and for those years following. And we should regularly revisit uh, all of our policies to ask if they are up to the challenges of the day. And I think there are real concerns with the current equalization formula itself, and we absolutely should talk about them. But the referendum that uh, we'll be asked to vote on in the fall is not about the design of the equalization formula. It's not about tweaking this parameter or that or evaluating the pros and cons of one reform option or another. It's about scrapping the entire principle of the equalization uh, program. So I turn back to Premier uh, Peter Lougheed, you know, great uh, Premier that many fondly look back to here in Alberta. He was very strongly committed to this principle of equalization being included in the Constitution. He called it a crucial aspect of Canadian Confederation that he strongly supported be in the Constitution. But he would always then follow up those statements. But we have concerns around the formula design, and, and that's fine. And so I think we should roll up our sleeves as Albertans. We should expect our government to engage productively with the federal government, making recommendations for reform, working with other premiers to get those reforms implemented, rather than deleting what has been a, a fundamental aspect of federalism in Canada, actually, since the very beginning. Yeah, except for it's not going to happen, right, Dr. Toom? I mean, it's just not going to happen. Uh, can we talk about, I mean, I, I recognize you're not a constitutional lawyer, but I do know you understand how it works. To make this happen, uh, you would be setting the table for a whole bunch of other things, uh, which, which would be foundational shifts. I mean, tectonic activity, right, when it comes to the Constitution and how the federal government interacts with the provinces. So if, and, and let, maybe it's not too much of a stretch to say that this is probably a referendum that if I were to guess will pass and so we'll have a majority, but potentially not like a landslide though, voting to remove this section of the constitution. The government's argument is then that the federal government would be obliged to negotiate in good faith uh, with the province around this issue. You're right to note that maybe this opens up a, a can of worms as constitutional discussions tend to uh, in Canada. And, you know, personally, I don't think we should be too afraid 
uh, of that. Canada, you know, should engage in difficult conversations, you know, if it needs to. But here, with respect to equalization and its place in the Constitution, what are we negotiating? What is it that we want to talk about at the table with the federal government? The government of Alberta, the premier, uh, many others haven't put forward any real substantive reforms that they would like to see changed. They just rail against the formula being unfair to Alberta. And that's not unique to the UCP. I don't want to pick just on, on Premier Kenny. You had the former NDP government in Alberta making similar statements about equalization not working for Albertans. Uh, you have Liberal Premier in Ontario saying it's perverse and nonsensical and that is completely broken. So this is not a partisan issue. You have lots of provincial politicians playing on the program. Uh, when they don't actually have specific things that they want to see change. So first, what are we negotiating? Maybe we should be clear about what changes we'd like to see first before demanding negotiations take so place. And second, we already talk with the federal government regularly. There are committees set up already to explore these transfer issues. We're already at the table. So you might say, for example, Alberta may propose that uh, because Quebec, some of Quebec's revenue is exempted from from equalization, correct? Um, well, I, I, I'm, I'm talking at a, a junior high school level of understanding here, but Alberta may wish to see, for example, resource revenue excluded, resource royalties excluded, correct? Sure. So the issue with Quebec is not that revenues are excluded. It's that resource revenues include revenues from hydroelectricity sales. And I think the case is quite strong that hydroelectricity prices in Quebec are potentially too low. And what you have is the government foregoing resource revenues, making themselves appear to have a lower fiscal capacity than they actually really do. And that benefit then accrues to Quebecers in the form of lower electricity prices, and the government receives a larger equalization payment. So that's been a long standing concern for years, um, Quebec hydro pricing. So it's not an Alberta specific concern, but that's an example of something where absolutely we should talk about how to do that better. I uh, will will always cheer for Alberta's success as, as a born and raised Alberta boy. But can we acknowledge that Alberta has been on both sides of this equation before? Right before Leduc, number one, Alberta's reality was a little bit different and nothing is guaranteed forever. Can I point that out? It's worth pointing out. Uh, now, equalization started in 1957, and, and right from that point forward, Alberta did have a much better economic and fiscal situation than other regions. In fact, we received an equalization payment when the program first started up in 1957, and that was also the same year that Ernest Manning, uh, the longest-serving premier in Alberta, made dividend payments to Albertans of roughly the same size as equalization. He would say that it came from the natural resource revenue pool, but basically we were collecting equalization from the feds at the same time that we were distributing uh, the Ralph Bucks of their day yeah. uh, to Albertans. And so we've always been, since this program uh, started up, we've always been in a pretty good situation. That remains true today. Does it hurt Alberta potentially looking in, in the future? And again, I don't mean to come across as pessimistic or uh, anything like that, but I mean, you know, should Alberta's uh, revenues uh, continue to dip? Should we see, uh, you know, sustained, um, what do I want to call it, challenges in the traditional energy sector? I mean, could this get to a point where all of a sudden it makes less and less sense for Alberta to rally against this equalization formula? What does your crystal ball tell you? So I, I definitely do not have a crystal ball. I think a lot of indications are that Alberta's economy, at least in the foreseeable future, will perform above the Canadian average, if not maintaining that top spot that we have been in since, well, at least a half century. So we have a young population that contributes to higher employment rates, which contributes to higher GDP, higher income, and therefore higher fiscal capacity of the provincial government. So as long as Alberta has a productive economy with young workers, we're almost surely going to have above average levels of fiscal capacity in the province. And, and that's not entirely tied to oil and gas. I mean, we have a lot of strength in a lot of areas uh, that don't get as much credit as they should. So if I were to bet, I would bet on Alberta being above average, if not that top spot. For, for decades to come. So I suspect uh, when, when you say you don't think it's going to be a landslide, I've got all kinds of theories uh, about the reason why 
uh, this question will be included um, on the ballot this fall, municipal elections. Number one, I think because party loyalists, conservative party loyalists will expect it. Jason Kenney's essentially promised to do it. I know that some people think that it's a waste of money, uh, myself included, but I also think that it's a great way for the provincial government to draw or to attract a certain type of voter to the polls. And I think that more progressive candidates in municipal elections Uh, are going to have to fight pretty hard to communicate why it's important for people to show up. Um, Do you have any theories? I mean, I know you're here to talk about economics. I know you're here to talk about equalization. But do you have any theories about why this? If people are saying, listen, there's there's, you know, we talked about non-binding federal votes. I mean, it's the same sort of thing here. Ottawa is not obliged to act on this in, in any way, shape or form. In so many ways, is Ottawa is not obliged to act on Alberta's Senate elections. But what are your thoughts around the inclusion of this question on the ballot this fall? Why do you think it's on there? So uh, the premier had committed to it in his leadership race. I think going back all the way to 2017, other leadership contenders did the same. I think it was Brian Jean that came out with it uh, first. And and in general, politicians following through on their very clear commitments, I don't have a, a big problem with. And so I don't think... The, the reason why we're having a referendum is, is much more complicated than it has been a consistent commitment by the premier and the party for years. Uh, and, and they are following through on that. It, it does serve a convenient political uh, role for the government because, to quote the premier, equalization is the most powerful symbol, in his words, of the unfairness in Alberta's deal in Confederation. So he's using equalization as a symbol for other concerns uh, unrelated to equalization, some like pipelines and energy infrastructure policies and carbon tax. I mean, all of the above, equalization is this catch-all way to, uh, I guess, direct frustration towards Ottawa away from the provincial government here in Alberta. So yeah, you're right to note that that might draw out uh, many of his uh, core base supporters, but equalization is also a symbol for his opponents because this is kind of an opportunity to potentially snub uh, the premier and and the party. So I don't know which of those uh, forces are stronger. It'll be certainly interesting to watch. Let me ask you to play political scientist for a second because I get the Uh-oh. sense that I, I get the sense that I don't think anybody's going to going to come out and 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 just spell out in this sense that a no vote to this referendum question would be an anti Alberta vote but I do think the sentiment will be there I think the implication will be why are you voting against Alberta or why are you voting for the Trudeau liberals or why are you voting against equal or fair treatment for your home pro I think that there will be that bit of a sentiment and I'm intrigued by you invoking the name of Peter Lougheed because I think if you looked back you would probably have not maybe not consensus, but I think a majority of Albertans would probably rank Peter Lougheed as the most respected premier in Alberta's history, potentially the most effective premier in Alberta's history. Uh, and a few other names may pop up, but Peter Lougheed seems to me to be in rarefied air. Uh, he was not afraid to fight for Alberta on the federal landscape. He was certainly not afraid to defend Alberta's interests, but the story that you tell implies that he was open to or supportive of, of equalization, at least in some form. So what would you say or what, what would you forecast the conversation needs to look like when it comes to the idea of a no vote on this referendum being a vote against Alberta's interests or a vote against Alberta? So I, I think equalization and the principle of equalization being in the Constitution benefits Alberta. Even though we don't receive payments through the program, this is fundamentally why not just uh, Stephen um, Lougheed, but Ernst Manning, Harper, other Alberta political leaders have favored this kind of program. Stephen Baker, Saskatchewan Prime Minister, also favoring this kind of program. What it does is it allows for decentralization in Canada by ensuring that even low-income provincial governments can deliver health and education to their citizens by ensuring that Canadians everywhere have access to reasonable public services, it allows for provinces to be responsible for those public services. If we didn't have a program like equalization, you can imagine the pressure to centralize the delivery of health care and education would be much stronger than it is. And that would not be, I would suspect, in the interests of Alberta 
as far as those who typically oppose equalization would see it. So it's a program that allows for Canada to be what is truly one of the most decentralized federations in the world. And I think this is the underlying reason why uh, you have former Alberta governments strongly supporting it. In other words, you could make the argument that a vote for the equalization formula is a vote toward provincial autonomy. That's, that is, yep, uh, that is not a stretch. And sometimes that is explicitly why I think even Diefenbaker in his 57 campaign, right after the equalization program was started up, their election platform at the time uh, was committed to that equalization program that their liberal opponents introduced earlier that year because it allows for decentralization and national unity at the same time. So where do you see this going? I mean, you talk about, you know, uh, former Premier Kathleen Wynne in Ontario, liberal premier uh, railing against this. You, you talk about former Alberta premier Rachel Notley addressing it. I don't remember Rachel Notley banging the drum nearly as loudly as Jason Kenney, but you've certainly made the point that it, it has been a debate or a discussion or a talking point that has spanned party lines. What you do obviously reiterate is it's the have provinces. It's the provinces you know, paying into it, so to speak, or paying more than they're getting back ish, uh, you know, that are taking real issue with this, which is not surprising. I mean, which province wouldn't like to cut down its deficit by keeping more or receiving more from the federal government? That's obvious. Makes it easier for the finance ministers in those provinces to be able to put budgets that are more palatable in front of the general population. But you've got the have not provinces. There's no way in hell that they're going to look to shake this tree. Right. And so where ultimately do you see this going? I mean, do you think that there's an appetite? Can you see consensus among the provinces? Can you see provinces like Alberta? Can you see the Alberta government cooperating with the federal government to make meaningful tweaks here? I mean, or is this all just essentially a conversation about something that's never going to happen? So I, I think that comes down to whether we can go beyond some of the short-term political calculations that are, I think, driving some of the decisions, at least in Alberta and, and by Alberta's government. And this is not new. It, interestingly, if you look back since 1957 and ask how frequently did the word equalization come up in the Calgary Herald? Like, when are we talking about the program in Alberta? And you see that we talk about equalization 70% more in periods where the federal government is a liberal one than when it is a conservative one. So in part, there's always going to be some politics here. Moving forward in a productive way with other premiers, I think we saw that through the stabilization debate, uh, which is a separate program uh, meant to provide a kind of insurance to provinces who experience rapid and, and significant revenue declines. That was an issue for Alberta and for Newfoundland and Labrador. But in conversation with other premiers, we did get unanimous agreement by the premiers on expanding the scale and the scope of that program. And the federal government did respond in November of last year and expanded that program, not as much as Alberta wanted, but it certainly puts us in a better position than where we were. So I think if Alberta put forward some sensible, evidence-based, you know, well-developed proposals for equalization, that might very well move forward because COVID has changed things and it's changed things for a lot of provinces. And so I don't think that you would have any provincial government firmly against any reform. I think the issue is what are the pros and cons of those reforms? And that requires that we think through what it is that we think is wrong uh, with the formula. What are some alternatives? And then roll up our sleeves and work with others to get those done. Professor, while we have you here and before we thank you for your time, uh, you know, you're obviously paying attention to markets, economic activity, you know, and, and we're in, in a period where I think most people are starting to feel, you know, that we could be emerging out of this last 18 months or so. This 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 challenge that has been uh, the covid-19 pandemic, one that no one will soon forget. And we talk about Canada's post pandemic recovery and then we break that down to provinces as well and, and see how uh provincial economies are faring early on do you see indicators i mean at least off the top of your head i know we didn't ask you specifically to come on and talk about this but where's your head at with regards to the numbers you're seeing the activity you're perceiving and whether or not the economies of of, of western canada and and across the country are starting to come out of this fog 
So I think the recovery that we have been seeing in recent months uh, is a lot stronger than what many anticipated it would be. So the depth of the contraction in 2020 was not as deep as what we thought it might be when we turn the clock back to March and April and try to remember what we were picturing at that time. Things didn't work out as bad economically in 2020. And right now, fiscally and economically, things have improved quite a bit. Indeed, nationally, overall GDP in Canada is almost back to its pre-COVID level. And the largest source of economic uh, and labor market slack is found in sectors that are directly affected by, by COVID, accommodation, food services, retail, uh, recreation and cultural activities. So once vaccination rates really ramp up significantly more in terms of second doses later this month and through July, I think we'll see through the summer a fairly rapid uh, increase in activity in those still heavily affected sectors. So I think the recovery is remarkably strong given the scale of the shock. And, and that, of course, all comes down to uh, vaccines coming on the scene a, a lot sooner than what many were uh, predicting last year. And so that's great to see. In terms of Alberta specifically, uh, a, a lot of our fiscal challenges are really driven by oil prices. I mean, the reason why we have a deficit is largely because of oil prices falling off a cliff back in 2014, 15, and 16, and not really recovering back to those levels. But now we're seeing oil prices above $70 per barrel, which is way higher yeah. than yeah. what the budget earlier this year was projecting. So I think we're going to see our, our projected deficits shrink dramatically as well. So things I think are looking up in a real way. Deficits, uh, pardon me, the uh, the forecasts, I think were, were they're about 62. I mean, it depends on what year you're looking at, but it was about That's 62, right. 63 bucks a barrel, right? That's right. And each dollar per barrel is about $230 million yeah. to the provincial bottom line. So if you're talking five bucks a barrel, that's a billion dollars, 10 bucks a barrel, $2 billion. So these are significant changes when we're thinking about tens of dollars per barrel higher than what we previously forecast. I was talking to a senior advisor uh, to Alberta's premier a short time ago, and he's, he's very bullish on the future of, of oil and gas and started flirting now i don't want, i'm not gonna put words in his mouth but he was hinting to he was alluding to the fact that he could see a hundred dollar oil again can you see it i don't think the question is can we reach that level or not it's really how long does it stay at that level and mm -hmm. i don't see that it stays above a hundred dollars per barrel for any meaningful length of time because that what that will do is just bring on new supply uh, of oil elsewhere bringing that price right back down and a lot of that hinges on uh, drilling in the united states so the cost of these horizontal wells in the states much lower uh, than $100 a barrel. So you might see a big increase in production there. But of course, that also depends on federal policies um, uh, there. So again, I don't have a crystal ball, so we'll see. But I would be very skeptical that we get oil prices sustainably above uh, that level. I know you keep saying you don't have a crystal ball. but let me, So let me just ask you, whatever, whatever metaphor you want to use for predicting the future, um, your tea leaves or whatever else, Trev, uh, when it comes to this referendum question, the yes votes will represent what percentage of the total vote? What percentage? <laughs> come on, I'll, I'll put one on the well, record. Whatever too. I say, you'll replay this uh, later yeah, on. Yeah, exactly. Uh, but I'll I'll put one on. Do you want me to go first? Um, I think that it's I think it's going to be a seventy eight percent yes vote. What do you think? So I think it'll be a lot closer than that. When okay. polls of Albertans ask them about the principle of equalization, you have 57% in the last Environics poll in Alberta saying they support the principle of equalization. So if the campaign and if the discussion is focused on the principle, not the practical implementation of the principle and the formula, then the support for it maybe a lot higher than uh, than we might guess. So I, I agree that yes, we'll win, but I would put it on a much closer uh, outcome than 78%. Uh, okay. percent, yes. Oh, but you didn't, you, you got to give me a number. I got yeah, I'll give you a number. Yeah. 55. 55. Book it. 
One of us is buying. One of us is buying lunch for the other. You and I have never had. Yeah. You and I have never had real life cold beers, Trevor. And we got to rectify that at some point when we can all gather again. Always grateful for your perspective. Always grateful for your expertise. Thanks for spending a part of your Wednesday morning with us. Thank you for having me. Great to be here. Yeah, you got it. That's uh, Trevor Toome, uh, a professor of economics out of the University of Calgary. And and it's been kind of cool to see. I mean, he's done such great, uh, I don't know if you call it advocacy work. I mean, if he if he's advocating for a better understanding of the economy and the Constitution and equalization and all these types of things, then it, then it would qualify as advocacy. But he's done amazing work. Uh, some of you are chiming in and saying, oh, I've heard a, I heard him speak at this university or I heard him, you know, present with this other individual at this other conference, or whatever the case may be. He's always out there trying to make things more simple and easier to understand. Again, that Alberta Views piece, uh, we're proud subscribers of Alberta Views magazine here on Real Talk. I encourage you to do the same. They do a great job oftentimes exploring some of the some of the issues that have been underexplored when it comes to Alberta politics. You can check them out online, Alberta Views magazine, that piece, Misplaced Anger, Western Alienation and the Battle Over Equalization. Isn't it is, interesting, though, that the fact that it's like that that article was from 2019 and it still holds true. Like we're still everyone like there's still you that is still being used as a I don't know if I'd call it a wedge issue, well, it's but it's still long being, ago. 2019. It's two years. That's nothing. I mean, I, if it's like 25 years ago, I think you could probably you could probably reference essays from 25 years ago that would still hold true about this. I'm just you know yeah. what I'm you know what you know, he's saying. And and it, because he's he's positive and optimistic, well, he's realistic, but he's optimistic. I mean, he doesn't come on and just like pull the pin and start throwing hand grenades at every levels of government. He's a he's a measured, reputable. You know, he doesn't run his mouth like a talk show host, but he comes on here and he and he talks about you know where where the debate has been and and all these and and, and then I say we we try to pin him down and say Doc, you got to give us you wanted a number the actual number because that's what you know that's what happened. You can't you know get all wishy washy and this that and the other. It could be no, I want a number. Now I'm going high. 78 percent because i believe that voters can be easily misled and because i believe that a lot of people that are going to be voting on this are going to perceive the question are you pro alberta or are you anti alberta it's going to be dumbed down it's going to be misrepresented and so then what it'll do is you know as if it's a mistake as if it's an accident is it'll give alberta's government and alberta's politicians you know fodder to say 78% or 63% or whatever it is, the majority of Albertans believe that we're getting screwed. We're getting the shaft. You know, we deserve difference. And then the government will perceive that as a mandate, Mm -hmm. right? The government will sit there and say, hey, listen, you know, we're not going to the polls right now. No way this government would send us to the polls right now. They've still got two more years to, to try to get everybody to forget about a few things, right? And that's an eternity in politics. And maybe they'll be successful, But right now, this is a way for the government to say, we perceive this. We've been banging the drum on equalization. We've been we've been adopting a certain vernacular. And the majority of Albertans, or at least the majority of those that turned out to vote this fall, given plenty of advance notice and every opportunity to have their say, have renewed our mandate to continue conducting ourselves in this way, to continue this line against Ottawa. That is Justin Trudeau hates Alberta. That's what I think the vote's going to do. And so for, for Dr. Toome to say, you know, if everybody understands and if there's good education and if people really recognize the background to this and well, yeah, but since when was that a reality when it came to elections? Right. We've always not. We've always said I shouldn't say that, but we've joked oftentimes that the real problem with democracy is that everybody gets a vote. <laughs> That's the that's the main thing I would change about democracy. But in all seriousness, I hope that people understand. I won't say what's at stake here because nothing's really at stake. But I don't hope people understand the context of the question. I think it would embolden. And I think the word that you used mandate will be thrown around if if it goes the way that that you have predicted. And I mean. It would be a majority if it was fifty five percent, like yeah. Trevor said. Yeah. But I would, I would warn, I would warn you because if you are playing Price is Right rules, you are over. You would be over if yeah. it was on the Daily Double. Yeah. Oh, no, 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 not Daily Double. That's Jeopardy on the uh, the Showcase Showdown. That's right. And you want to get the you want to get. Gosh, it's been a long time since I watched. Is it Drew Carey still hosting it? I have no idea. 
I, think I, I just whenever I think of Price of Right, I always think of Bob Barker. There's just no two ways about it. Yeah, one of my favorite interviews of all time. He was, uh, yeah. You got to interview Bob yeah. Barker. Yeah, except for, I'd like to take. Well, because it because it, it wasn't an interview that was like, gosh, you're a lovable guy. Gosh, you're a legend and a Hall of Famer. It was about Lucy. How did you know? It was about Lucy the Elephant at the Edmonton Valley Zoo. Right. And I adopted a line of... You did it. You want the truth? You want the real talk? You want the real talk? I do. I was a young kid. I was a young whippersnapper. And I had an exclusive. Nobody else had him. And we went live at noon at the TV station I was working at at the time. We had an exclusive sit down with Bob Barker. And I was making a name for myself. And I adopted the line of, I mean, I didn't speak like this to him. I mean, the guy's a freaking legend. But I was basically like, who do you think you are dropping here into Edmonton with no real knowledge of Lucy and the care that she's receiving and demanding that she be sent to an elephant sanctuary? And what do you really know about the Edmonton Valley Zoo? And how can it? And I remember that the interview started with, I got my picture with him at the beginning, which is a veteran move. I mean, first of all, the real veteran move is reporters never get pictures with their interview subjects. That's the real veteran move. <laughs> but, but one you, step down from that. But you think I would take back the picture I have shaking Bob Barker's hand? Not a chance. Hell no. I mean, the, the way that it was angled and my jawline. I mean, I just looked fabulous. I mean, the photo is, I mean, it's just one of those iconic. They're going to show it at my funeral. Anyway. So we shake hands at the beginning, which is good because he didn't want to shake my hand at the end. And I and I basically, you know, I, I sort of was like, you know, and, and I remember him and he's kind of like he's kind of giving me these eyes like, are you fucking kidding me? Like, that's the I'm getting the Bob Barker look like he's thinking that we're going to I'm going to be like, so like, how's it been to like work on prices right for all these years? And, and what's up with the spay and neuter your pets anyway? And how'd you get into that? But really, it was more of like a, you know, and, and let me just say. My opinion on Lucy has completely changed. Like 180. Uh, but I was going to say, we don't have time to get into that, but we do. But I'm, <laughs> I'm not sure. I just, I, it, my heart breaks for Lucy at the Edmonton Valley Zoo. I know we're going to hear from people, friends of mine are on the board there and they back the zoo and they support it. And it's great learning opportunities for kids and all these kinds of things. But elephants are social animals. And I just think it's so sad that she's in this northern climate all by herself. You know, mm-hmm. oh, look, she likes to paint. Like, you know what she probably would rather do is hang out with other elephants. I didn't think that we were going to get into talking about Lucy the Elephant today. I could never have predicted that. Yeah, people talk about it, and I know what we're going to get. Ryan, she has a sinus condition, and she can't breathe in transport, and she would die. She would die on her way down to California. They've transported elephants. I mean, there were there were older elephants that were sent from Toronto all the way down to California. I think it was California, to a sanctuary there, and they're thriving. Um, maybe we can get into Lucy in just a second. I want to remind you that, you know, we've been talking a lot about advocacy lately. You know, it is an allyship uh, especially now it's it's pride month as you know through the month of june if your workplace is actively practicing allyship or at least has made a commitment to a lot of organizations don't really know where to start so in their endeavor to build inclusive communities they're looking to power ed and you can check it out at powered.ca This is a great opportunity for online, on-demand learning. PowerEd.ca by Athabasca University to celebrate Pride Month is offering a 10% discount for Real Talk audience members. That's right. Your entire organization here could could complete this course. It's online, on-demand, estimated to be a six to eight hour commitment. Do it over the course of one day as a team. Maybe split it up over the course of a couple days or a week. That's the whole point of PowerEd. You do it at your pace. So to celebrate Pride Month, a 10% discount for Real Talkers, visit PowerEd.ca. Use Real Talk 10 at checkout to claim your offer. Real Talk 10. Whether this is an individual commitment to allyship or whether it's an organizational endeavor, again, Real Talk 10 is your promo code at PowerEd.ca. We also wanted to remind you the team at Westworld Computers keeps this studio powered and they can do the same for your workplace or your home office. For more than 40 years, they've been family owned and proudly operating out of Edmonton online at westworld.ca. You can book an appointment for their service technicians or browse their inventory and they will ship absolutely anywhere. Go to westworld.ca and 
tell them that Real Talk sent you. Also want to remind you the team at Park Power is powering our hashtag Real Talk RJ. I saw some great tweets about Dr. Trevor Toom, who was just on here. Park Power is big into community. It's why they support Real Talk as a builder. It's also why they take 10% of their profits and share it in their communities. If this is the type of thing you can get behind, you need internet, electricity, and natural gas service anyway, why not take your business to Park Power? The promo code 2021 Real Talk gets you $70 off your first bill. And also, a big shout out to the teams at Alta Moving and Storage. They know that this is the time of year where you're going to start considering or maybe making plans for your family to move to its new home. You're downsizing, you're upsizing, whatever the case may be. Moves can be stressful. They're proud to have these pod-style moving containers that take the stress out of the move. Again, you move at your pace. They pick up the pod when you're ready. They drop it off at the new location. You unload it at your leisure When you visit altastorage.ca and give them a call to book your move, you make sure you let them know that you heard about Alta Moving and Storage on Real Talk. All of our sponsors are under the Sponsors tab at ryanjesperson.com. Let's get to this conversation. When When it comes to equity in the workplace... How do we impact meaningful change there? This feels like a real change maker show, doesn't it? I don't know that that's anything different than usual, but it feels like we've identified three or four foundations that we're going to try to rock this morning. Is that how you <laughs> approached booking Wednesday's show? Did you just decide that every 10 minutes we were going to find a different institution to bang on the door? I don't know why you would say that. <laughs> Uh, but I, uh, but I really like I. We've talked about this, Ryan, where we say, you know, we're not about chasing headlines. It's about hundred percent about look r- well, real talk. Not to be redundant, yeah, but real talk. So what's actually being discussed, and you know, what's kind of percolating and marinating just underneath the surface, and that's what I'm interested in. So, yeah. um, and I'm that's what I'm hoping real talkers and and you are interested in. So. Well, I'm looking forward to talking to K- to Katie German, who's the program director at Food Share uh, Toronto. It's a nonprofit publicly calling on Charity Village, which is a job posting website to publish all wages and salaries. When it comes to the jobs that are posted, when it comes to calling for applications for CVs, they see it as an equity issue. Katie joining us live this morning. Welcome to the show. Thanks for making time. This is great. Thanks for having me. I'm happy to chat. You bet. Katie, do I pronounce it German? Is that how you say your last name? Yep, you got it. Okay, good stuff. Good stuff. So, this, so this is a letter that's that's been signed off by by obviously yourself as well as Paul Taylor, your executive director, Gloria Padilla, the finance director, and and, and your your senior directors as well, writing an open letter, uh, prompting, hoping to prompt public conversation about equity in the workforce, specifically salaries that are posted on job listings. Is this about the gender wage gap, or is this about more than that? Well, I've, uh, Food Share is a food justice organization, so we take uh, justice as our primary focus, which includes gender, um, but also foundational to that is conversations around race and racial justice. So posting the wage uh, and salary compensation and having pay transparency is fundamentally a, a gender justice issue, but is also one of racial justice. So we know that women... Uh, for every dollar that a white man makes, women make 80 cents um, for similar work. Um, but if you break that down further, for black women, it's in, it's in the 60 cent range. And for Latinx and indigenous women, it's actually in the 50 cents range. So it is, yes, a gender issue, but it is also fundamentally an issue of racial justice as well. So what's the idea here? Is, 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 is the implication that there's a job posting that said, you know, we're looking to hire a, a regional manager for this? And they get the application and, and it's from John Smith who comes in and, 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 and he's a, you know, a middle-aged white guy and he's got 15 years experience and a bachelor's degree. And they say, we'd love to bring you on and we can pay you 87000 a year. Uh, and, and, then, and then perhaps a woman of color comes in or perhaps a, another individual from, from a, a visible minority or, 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 or perhaps a, you know, among that gender spectrum. And they say, okay, well, you're, you're also very qualified. We'd love to offer you the job, but we kind of think we can get away with paying you like 72 And so we can offer for you 72 and that's the pay you're going to make is, is this the implication that because the salary is not listed it's in flux depending on who shows up for the interview yes absolutely so what pay transparency would do is 
first of all, not waste anybody's time because people are applying for positions that they know what they're going to be compensated for if they get that position. And also employers are not wasting their time by getting to the end of a, of a competition process and then offering a salary that someone's not going to accept because it's less than what maybe they currently make or what they need to live, especially in a city like Toronto, where the living wage is $22.08 per hour um, to get by. So what it does is it sheds light on um, how much people make and it forces organizations to move towards a principle of equal pay for equal work. So at Foodshare, we have a standard pay grid for all uh, positions, all pay bands. It's public. It's on our website. Every employee knows what every position makes and all staff who do the same job get the same pay. We don't negotiate salaries. We're upfront at the beginning what the salaries are and what the compensation packages are. And that's fundamentally an issue of equity and trying to ensure that people are offered the same salary, the same compensation, the same benefits and wages when they are taking on the same level of risk and responsibility by doing the same work. And what it does is helps you eliminate bias um, that's present in all of us, present in employers, present in HR. There's tons of research that people um, hire people who look like them and they hire people who resonate with their shared experience. And when you have uh, employers and managers and senior leadership, who in our sector and across many sectors are predominantly white, they're gonna hire more white people. Um, and the way that you address that is by actually institutionalizing some change. So we actually have pay transparency legislation that passed in Ontario um, that would make it a legal requirement for every publicly posted job posting to list the compensation and the salary and it passed. Um, and when the Ford government came in, they put in bill 57, which didn't change the legislation but it pushed it to, for consultation. So right now we have a fully formed piece of legislation that passed in our legislature that is just sitting with no implementation date. And that legislation would also make it illegal to ask, uh, ask a candidate what they currently make or what they've previously made so that you can't base their compensation based on what they've made in other places. Um, there's lots of good stuff in that legislation, and it's just sitting <laughs> under consultation, um, waiting to be implemented. Yeah, but yeah, I mean, obviously, because yeah. because businesses don't <laughs> want this, to be exactly. honest, right? Businesses yeah. don't want this at all. But the thing to know is it's good for business. Like if you have good HR practices, if you have clear transparency, if you are upfront about what you offer your employers and it's clear that you employees, sorry, that you're going to offer those employees fair and consistent packages, like those people are going to want to work for your organization and they're going to want to stay at your organization. And that's better for business to have retention and to reduce your costs of just constantly turning people over and over through an employer cycle. So is it the one solution? No, but is it a key solution to have this pay transparency in effect? Absolutely. And it's good for all businesses. So Katie, we just recently hired and, and as we look to add to our team, it was the first job posting that we'd really written. And when it came to posting the salary or the compensation on the listing, we did not. Not. And that's because we had and I'm not saying I'm not open minded to it. And, and I had not seen the hashtag show the salary and you make a very compelling argument. I consider myself to be an open minded, progressive person. But from a business standpoint, we said, here's what we think would be the minimum salary we'd be comfortable paying. In other words, like we're a startup, we're grassroots. You know, we have Patreon supporters that that make sure that you know we we are joined in this journey and we're building something here. But we can't be handing out big, enormous, bloated salaries, not yet. But at the point, we said we want to attract. Here's what we're going to pay. We we want to make sure that 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 our you know this person we hire is going to be well compensated. But we also know what would be our ceiling. And that gave us a window. And that window would depend on things like experience, education, what that person brings to the table. So what would you recommend? To me, it doesn't work to put X salary. Like th whoever gets this job is going to make this exact amount. Do you put a range? Do you say this job's going to pay between whatever and whatever? and then negotiate that with the applicant? I mean, it seems to me to be taking some of the cards out of the deck when it comes to the employer and an important negotiation process. Right, that's a great question. So I think that you can absolutely post a range. A range is better than nothing. And if a range is how your organization functions, then that's also accurate, right? This level of position, a management position or a producer position, 
is going to make between 50 to 60,000 and have this much vacation. If that's how you function and everyone who might work for your organization has sort of equal access to that information and that's how pay is negotiated, that's great. That's better than just posting a job and people have to guess, is this $14 an hour or $18 an hour or $30 an hour? Am I getting health benefits or not? Do I currently have health benefits? Can I afford to leave them? Is this how much of a risk am I taking in putting this energy forward? And I think you make a great point when you say it's taking some of the power away from the employer in the, go the negotiation. And I think that that's good. <laughs> I think that we have a very real power. And I think you agree with me there. I that's, do. There's a really clear power imbalance there. And that's something that needs to be addressed. Um, and this is a very straightforward, easy way to lift, uh, you know, the playing field a little bit. So there's a little bit more equal footing. Yeah. Katie. And I would question the idea of paying people more based on experience or education and really consider if that's a requirement for your position. In Toronto, if someone's paying $2,200 to rent a one bedroom apartment, their landlord does not care if they're an experienced <laughs> in their career just starting out or 30 years into their career or not. Their cost of living is the same. So that's a key factor for, for a lot of folks. And also the job responsibilities, if they're the same, do you actually need someone with more education or more experience to do that job effectively? In some cases, yes, you need a certified you know, chartered accountant, and that person needs a certain level of experience and accreditation. But what we've seen is a lot of job postings that list uh, accreditation or they give um, additional benefits or salary based on experience when that experience is not actually a requirement of the job. Mm. And that sounds like a good thing to do, that you're rewarding people for their experience. But what you end up doing is rewarding folks who were privileged enough to gain that experience in many cases. Um, and like right off the bat, excluding people who probably have a really important set of skills and a wealth of experience that they can bring, but it isn't valued in the same way in the sort of job posting HR economy. So one thing we've done at Foodshare is we actually deprioritize um, accreditations of any kind. So we do not list post-secondary education on any posting unless it's actually a bona fide requirement of the job. And I will be honest that I would say in the years that we've done that, I haven't found one case where we needed to actually list that. It's just court, sort of a practice that people do that has lived on, um, but that excludes people. And when we say people, it's it's mainly people of color, black folks, indigenous folks, low income folks who don't have access to the opportunity to go do an internship somewhere, to go travel abroad um, on a semester, to go get a master's degree, right? Even to do that through student loans, which is how I did it, still comes from a place of privilege to be able to access student loans, to access credit, to access debt. That's a, that's a point of privilege to be able to even do that. Um, so what we're trying to say at Foodshare is that we're just not going to engage in that anymore. And we would love to see other organizations make the same change. I feel like you, you, I, I want to have lunch with you sometime and get into this for like three hours because you're, yeah. the, you're the type of person that I can totally agree with and also totally disagree with at the same time. I, I think totally. I, I think a lot of what you're talking about is and, and you know what I almost use. We've been talking about choosing words carefully today. And, 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 and I was going to say, I think a lot of what you're talking about is honorable, but we use that word in a a way that almost dismisses the initiative don't we we say oh it's honorable mm. but that, then that's implying that i don't think that it's that it's adoptable or that i don't think right. that it's realistic or that i don't think that it's actually doable which i do um i want to i want to circle back and say you're 100 percent correct that if somebody's living in, in toronto or vancouver or for that matter edmonton or anywhere else that that the cost of living in, in canadian cities with the cost of living across the country here is higher than most people might realize and is typically not represented by where our minimum wage is at um, I would make and I don't like using the word argument but let me say I'd, I'd make the counterpoint to you that I think with a salary range when you're hiring for a new position the floor there needs to reflect where you would value that em employee in other words you would say this is this is regardless of who we hire this is the minimum that they're going to make and can we feel good about the minimum amount that we're paying right that fits into our budget that still yeah. ensures dignity quality of life healthy lifestyle and those types of things. Um, and I absolutely agree with you on, on the somewhat arbitrary nature of a lot of these job postings. It used to drive me nuts early in my career uh, where you know they'd say, you know, you need a minimum of five years experience on air. What's the difference uh, or, or, or working in a nonprofit or working on the front line and yeah. shipping, receiving or whatever you're doing? 
what's the difference between three and a half years of experience and five years of experience? What's the difference between two years and four? I'm not really sure. I mean, I have an undergraduate degree, a Bachelor of Arts in Communications, but that has really, in theory, in practice, at least nothing to do with what I'm doing right now. Right. We're not talking. I guess we talked about Marshall McLuhan a little bit a few few weeks ago, but that was it. (laughs) My university degree has nothing to do with what I'm doing right now. So you could argue that it's irrelevant. So I can see along those lines with you. But I also think and to bring this back to the point of the employer's perspective, that when you talk about taking power away from the employer, which we can both acknowledge would imply that we're putting power into the employee's hands or maybe creating more of an equitable balance of power though the employer will always have more. If an employer feels as though it's losing ground or seeding ground, it'll be less likely to adopt this, which I guess brings us back to the point that you were making earlier. It's got to be legislated. Yeah. I mean, right now it's legislated for federally federally regulated employers. Um, So they've had pay transparency legislation for a long time, um, like different versions of it. Uh, But that's only 10% of of jobs in Canada are federally regulated. So if you leave, if we're leaving it up for employers to implement something that the government said is important enough that they're going to implement on the jobs that they regulate, um, it's not working because <laughs> I would say a, a, a majority of employers are not following suit. But I will say, you know, we posted that letter and we put our senior leadership team all signed off on it. And immediately people reached out to us to say, I want to sign off on this letter. And we're talking about like large employers um, of all kinds working across sectors. And we opened up a way for people to sign on to that letter. And it's been open for a week. And I have about 75 organizations who have signed on and said, here's our logo. And so we're about to release a list of people who endorse the letter um, and who say that it's long past due for places like Charity Village and and people who have power to be able to make this change. And I mean, Charity Village as one example, and there are many others like them, but they even acknowledge that this is an equity issue and that they want to see this change happen. But they said it's not the law and they follow the law. So if we wait for people to implement this on their own, we want people to do that as possible. But what we need also is for this legislation to come through so that it's just not optional, so that employees are protected and employers aren't also wasting their time. I mean, I've gone through the hiring process a number of times with people coming on board and you get to the end and they realize what the salary is and they walk away or they realize that they can't negotiate and they walk away. So it's a it's a profound waste of time across the board. So it's good business to actually make changes like this across sectors. Yeah, interesting to see here. I've, I've, I've just Googled the uh, or not Googled, but I've searched on Twitter the hashtag show the salary. And here's one. I mean, look at this. The walrus uh, fellow by the name of Vu out of uh, Seattle says, you know, walrus, I noticed you didn't disclose the salary in your job posting here. Please have a policy to always hashtag yeah. show the salary as not doing so perpetuates racial and gender wage gaps disproportionately affecting black and other people of color. Colleagues, thank you. Look at this. The walrus. We've updated the job posting. Thanks. That's got to yeah. be a win. That's got to be a win for you. And Vu has signed on to our letter. So um, that person that you just tweeted about right there, they've signed on to endorse our letter to in Charity Village. So it's there's. And one of the interesting things that I've heard is as soon as we put the letter out, I heard from so many people who said they've been having the same conversation for a decade. Hmm. (laughs) And so it's time for us to see some movement, especially when something like this is fairly easy to implement. When I used to, you know, upload a job posting on a charity village and you fill out all the boxes, a bunch of the boxes have a little star beside them that say they're mandatory. You have to post the work location. You have to post the job title. You have to post some of these key criteria. It's like imagine a job posting that doesn't tell you where the job is. That We can't even think of that. <laughs> that would just be a totally useless job posting. You would have tons of people applying who would opt out eventually and saying, I, I can't believe you didn't give me that important information. It's very simple to where the compensation box is on these job posting websites, just put a little asterisk that makes that question mandatory. Um, And it's something that they themselves have have identified is an equity issue that needs to be addressed. And so we're saying, if you know it's a problem and you know it's an easy solution, then let's move ahead. Let's make some change. 
Katie German's our guest. If you're just tuning in live on the Mixler audio streaming app, Katie, the programs director with Food Share, uh, a nonprofit out of Toronto. When it comes to the, the, the gender wage gap, uh, Katie, or wage gaps uh, that, that exist uh, when it comes to other demographics, including uh, black and indigenous people of color, et cetera, um, what are some of the other, have you considered other approaches or other angles to this? I mean, obviously a big part of your advocacy is show the salary, but what other angles are you taking this from? Yeah. So um, some of the we food share wouldn't be doing this work if we hadn't also already done some of this work internally ourselves. So we've made some significant changes to our own HR practices and how we recruit and how we sort of go through the whole hiring practice. One of the key changes is that we actually fully anonymize every single job application that comes into our organization. So the the person doing the review of the resumes um, is receiving a resume that does not have uh, the candidate's name. It does not have their address. Um, it doesn't have anything that would tell you like what neighborhood that person lives in, um, any sort of like markers of their identity. And then all of those resumes get reviewed on a matrix. So there's like a standard review cap- like criteria. And that criteria comes directly from the job description. So if someone posts in their resume that you know they did it a, a year of study abroad, um, it, it's quite common if you're just kind of reading over a resume to say, oh, that sounds good. That's probably interesting, relevant experience. And you put that person towards the top of the pile. But if that doesn't connect to the job, if that doesn't show a connection to what you're actually looking for in that posting, and if you weren't upfront that that's something that you're looking for and other people didn't think to maybe um, include that information on their resume, you're already put like the bias is there, right? And you're putting people towards the top of the pile Um, So the way that you address that is by systemizing it and helping to uh, remove that bias. There's really good research that came from Toronto where they looked at um, black sounding names and white sounding names and criminal records um, and people applying for retail positions and managers across the board were more likely to call back someone with a criminal record and a white sounding name than someone without a criminal record and a black sounding name. So and that's just one study in well, that, one location. Katie, I had There's this conversation li- literally yeah. just a couple of weeks ago. It was a private conversation. Won't get into it too much. But a friend of mine, she's sure. a CEO. They employ about 30 people. And she told she's the CEO. And she told me that she actually thinks that, that uh, a job application process should have the names removed from yeah. the applications. I thought that and was... And that's what we do. Yeah. So when, when I'm reviewing a resume, HR has already taken the name off. So I'm only looking at the person's experience. Wow. Yeah. And then when we when we say, okay, these are the top five candidates that we want to bring in for an interview, at that point, uh, HR books the interview and then I and then I get to see that person's name. So it means I can't I can't tell from looking at a resume if it's someone that I know from my industry. I can't tell if it's someone who has a last name that I'm familiar with. I can't tell if they're from a rich part of the city or a low income part of the city. We fully anonymize all that, which is one way of removing some of that bias that exists among um, employers and management and anyone who's doing like the HR kind of hiring. The other thing we've done at FoodShare, when you talk about sort of wage rates and minimum, sort of what's the floor that you're comfortable with, um, is we decided this year we weren't comfortable with our minimum floor and we became a living wage employer. So in Toronto, that's 2208 per hour. So from this point on, no one at FoodShare will ever make less than $22.08 per hour for any position at FoodShare. And that includes youth positions um, and like positions in our warehouse that usually have been uh, minimum wage across the organization. And we also instituted a ratio between lowest paid and highest paid worker, which I'm really excited about. And I think that many places need to really wrestle with this is the difference between the wages that their lowest paid worker makes and their highest paid worker. Ours is one to three. So if you ever want to raise the wages of the executive team and the executive director at FoodShare, Moving forward, you cannot do it without also raising the wage of the lowest paid worker. So, Katie, you're saying if the ED is making 150, the lowest paid worker on staff has to make 50. Yep. And if the ED is going to go up to 200, the lowest paid worker also has to go up. So there is no opportunity at FoodShare anymore to give management a 20 percent raise and and other workers no raise or other workers a one or 2% raise. Wow. The other thing we've done is standardize the cost of living increase. So we do a 3% increase. Um, and it, that is universal to all employees across the organization, no matter what pay band you're in. 
um, which is not something that happens consistently to other employees. There's lots of, you know, bonuses based on performance or merit. We do it universally. Yeah. I have a million questions for you. Great. I have a million <laughs> questions. Because far like let's be like so you're a and and I'm just going to come into this and this is just the, I'm just I'm just putting I'm just this is intellectual free flow. Uh yeah. or yeah. intellectual might be giving myself too much credit. This is me- <laughs> th- this is mental free flow, but I'm thinking okay, hang on a second. This is very appealing to the so-called entry level workers. And this is very yeah. ap- the, the, and I'm talking specifically food shares uh, structure here, which I actually think is really neat. Um, so people are going to say, this is, we feel good about we're in an equitable workplace for the, for the most part, people understand. I mean, I've always worked in workplaces where nobody had in, I've been in really interesting workplaces, Katie. I've been in a union. I've been out of a union. When I was in the union, I knew that my position could be, you know, compensated, you know, let's say from 39 to 47,000 or from 77 to 84,000, depending on the job. So you knew the window. But then yeah. when it came to those outside the union, the six o'clock news anchors or the flagship talk show host, you had no idea how good was their agent, how long term was their contract, how long ago was it signed, who signed it with them. You might have people making 10 times. You might have people, you know, it's just nobody ever really knew. So I can understand how your structure would be appealing to a lot of people. I can also see how at the top of the chain, it may mm-hmm. detract really skilled and talented executives and I understand that nonprofit CEOs and EDs make less than they would in the in the public sector or private sector, or whatever the case may be, where there's a different rules of engagement, where the, where, the, where the landscape's a little bit different. Forgive the question. Is there yeah. concern that you may cap the organization's potential by turning off skilled executives that would say, hey, listen, the way that their fiscal reality and the way that this structure works, I just can't get on board with that. I mean, yeah. I'm not going to go from making 650 over here to making 150 over there. Yeah, I would say two things. One is that we're always looking at what other people in our sector are doing. So while we're looking at our own wage rate, we are saying, you know, if this is a manager at our organization, what is a manager making in our city at a comparable organization? And are we in line with them? So we can always make changes that way. If it turns out that executive directors are, are you know, are not compensated because whatever, comparable to the people who are doing similar work in the similar setting, um, we can make those changes, but we've now tied it to um, the lowest worker, which I think is key because the second point I want to make is there's an assumption that profitable businesses and in, in, in any sector are profitable because of the person at the top. And therefore that person has to be very well compensated. And we need to understand that that person only profits off of the extraction of the work of everyone else who's within that organization. So yes, that person at the top might be a visionary, might have incredible leadership, might be able to rally folks or whatever, make some high risk and responsible decisions. But if they don't have all those workers, they have nothing. And the idea that we need to attract top talent at the top and we can be sort of like, you know, if people leave, they leave down at the bottom. It doesn't matter. We can just replace them. It's minimum wage work, whatever. We need to stop thinking that way and really understand that the wealthy folks who who make all that money <laughs> um, and and reap the benefits of that profit, that profit comes from the labor of the workers in the organization mm-hmm. and to not compensate them for that work is exploitation like now we're talking bigger that's what it is now we're talking bigger <laughs> scale stuff right yeah. now, now, now this is this is like you know uh revolutionary type stuff right and 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 i'd be curious to see if if the general po- i mean this is the type of thing when you talk about workers rights and uh you know we'll be coming up later on on labor day and have these types of conversations and and i do think that those conversations have been had for a long time by uh you know again another word that seems to come loaded with baggage but activists which i don't think is inherently a bad word advocates is a softer way of saying it but advocates for equality in the workplace especially wage equality been talking about this for a long time yet there's been no shift we talked about Mumilak Kakak and her her goodbye speech in the House mm-hmm. of Commons yesterday, her, her goodbye speech to the House of Commons. And she talks about the foundations and government and systemic change that's that's yeah. needed but will not happen because it's a protected institution. What do you think has to happen for meaningful change like this to actually occur and be adopted by, you know, let me say be lazy, Fortune 500 companies? What do you think has to happen? Uh, people organizing. 
um, people like the power of people organizing because they can just ignore you at this point. And what we need is whether it's unions or not, it's the power of people coming together in a, a not just a majority, but a super majority and saying we will not stand for this anymore. And that's the level of pressure that has to be placed on uh, billionaires. That's the level of pressure that has to be placed on CEOs and high power people on boards. And that's the level of pressure that has to be placed on our government representatives. Hmm. And I think that there are people who can join government and make change and that should happen. And I think there are people who lead organizations and, and can make change and that should happen. But fundamentally the way that we see big wins in employment or in rights or in any of this is through super majorities of people coming together to say, this is important to our community, whether we're workers, whether we're residents, whether we're tenants, we're all agreeing to this one demand and you're gonna change it. <laughs> and we're seeing that happen here in Toronto with tenant organizing. Um, we're seeing that happening with workers organizing. And that's when you look at other countries, when you look at other economies, like the uniting sort of thread is when the people come together and say, you have to make this change. Um, and and it has to be now. Getting and some, that's how people win. Yeah, really interesting comments here on our live chat. Um, this from <laughs> Chad. <laughs> Chad, who's tuned in. No, no, it's a friendly live chat for the most part, Great. Katie. Yeah, you don't have to. <laughs> You don't have to. You don't have to wince. It, if you and I were doing this interview on on my previous show on AM radio, I'd say, Katie, buckle up, right? Do yeah. up your seatbelt. We're going to get into the text line. This is just a community of people that support one another despite political differences. It's it's actually really its own Great. unique, wonderful, beautiful animal. Um, but how about this from Chad? Uh, Chad was a professor at UBC. Uh, he says it was great to see uh, when I was uh, a professor at UBC marking exams just this past term. I could have the names redacted on the program mm -hmm. to remove bias in marking. That's a fascinating angle on this. What about this from Jordan? Jordan Croc. Jordan's got one of those names that, well, Jordan could be anybody, right? Jordan yeah. says, when I apply from jo for jobs, I often wonder about removing my middle name, Marie, from mm. my resume, which is an interesting and poignant insight as well. Yeah. I'm curious to see where this conversation goes. The hashtag show the salary is where you can learn more about this. And, and also want to point out that your team at FoodShare, uh, the Twitter account at FoodShareTO, you're, you're saying you've seen a lot of support for that open letter to Charity Village, which is this nonprofit job posting website. You're now asking members of the public to sign and publicly yeah. endorse your letter. Uh, so that can be a call to action for our audience. If what you're saying is resonating with them, Katie, before we thank you for your time, we haven't even talked about what you do at Food Share, <laughs> right? <laughs> Can we get great. into that for a minute? Can we? I mean, you're talking about uh, you know public <laughs> service. You're talking about equity. You're talking about yeah. supporting people. What do you do at Food Share, and and maybe what sort of an impact, if I can? It seems like every single interview these days is in the context of the pandemic. What's changed, yeah. if anything, over the past eighteen months? Sure. Yeah. So Food Share is in Toronto. Um, and we are a food justice organization. Uh, so what we're trying to see is, a, you know, a city of Toronto where everyone can feed themselves and their communities and their loved ones with dignity and joy. Um, so it means trying to build programs, build initiatives, push for advocacy that allows people in the city of Toronto to have the right to food. That's fundamentally what we need in this uh, country and in this city and in communities across Canada. Um, the main issue with food insecurity at the moment is income. Um, people do not have enough money to afford the foods that they need and that they want. So we uh, do a lot of advocacy work around that, but then we also run some programs that um, push to make uh, food more affordable and accessible for communities across Toronto that because of systemic marginalization, being historically underfunded, don't have access to affordable and culturally appropriate food in their community. So we run fresh produce markets. We do um, food box distribution programs. We do a lot of food education, but we focus on the politics of food and we focus on providing culturally affirming food education. Um, we're not really into messaging about health and nutrients and nutrition and more about um, how the food system works and how people have agency within that food food system and how they can engage with advocacy themselves. Um, 
with COVID, we saw a lot of our programs had to stop. A lot of our programs had to shift and then some of them really ramped up. So we had a program already in place called the Good Food Box, which is anyone in the city of Toronto can order a good food box. We deliver a box full of fresh produce directly to your door. Um, we do that as a social enterprise program. So revenue from that program uh, funds our other stuff that we're doing in community around food justice. So we were already running a door-to-door -door produce delivery service. And when COVID hit, we heard from so many communities across Toronto that you know, people had lost their jobs. They had lost access to food banks because a lot of food banks were run by volunteers who were staying home. Um, and they were told not to go to grocery stores. Uh, and they were trying to navigate how to still feed their families under those conditions. So what we did is pivoted very quickly and we launched a emergency good food box, which is the exact same box of food. So you're getting like the same quality um, and the same variety delivered to the person's door at no cost to the recipient. So that was funded entirely through like our own fundraising and working with community agencies to do that. So we actually went from doing 300 deliveries a week to 5,000 deliveries a week of produce boxes. So you talk to a lot of charities who like, you know, they had, they scaled back and their work really slowed down during COVID. And we were like, we, I think we hired 65 people in a two week period um, and went from one packing shift a week to two packing shifts a day for six days a week. How so, are you funded? Uh, a mix. So there's some, you know, United Way and city of Toronto, like municipal type funding, but um, the majority of our funding, I would say, especially during COVID, was individual donors. It was people seeing our work and reaching out and giving money, um, which was really incredible to see. So, and applying that sort of equity and food justice lens through our emergency good food box program, we prioritize getting food boxes out to uh, black families, um, precarious workers, migrant workers. We delivered good food boxes to farm workers. Um, uh, that were part of the seasonal agricultural worker program. We delivered boxes to sex workers. So we applied an equity lens to who are the folks who are the most vulnerable to food insecurity and making sure that they are getting um, access to those resources. And I think making those equity-based decisions really resonated with people because they thought, well, here's an organization that's getting to the folks who are the most food insecure and the most impacted by injustice. And that moved a lot of people to donate. So it's a different, uh, a lot of charities don't have a similar story <laughs> um, no. around how COVID looked for them. So no kidding. It's been an interesting time. Yeah. From 300 we were, we were to really, 5,000. I mean, yeah. Wow. A lot of work, but also like it meant a lot to our team to be able to do that. No um, kidding. Yeah. You know what? Yeah. And it's been a relative, and when I say new conversation, maybe just on, on my radar, but I mean, I, you know, uh, it seems to be more and more recurring the people talking about culturally appropriate food resources. And that's yeah. something that I think for most people, I, I mean, I know that a lot of people are happy to donate to the food bank or whatever. You know, they'll buy that extra bag at the grocery store and drop it into the bin. And there's like the cans of tuna and the craft dinner and whatever. Um, but the idea of culturally appropriate food hampers and baskets, I think, is one that obviously yeah. makes perfect sense. Right. But it's something that's not on most people's radar. And that doesn't mean I don't think that people aren't open to supporting it. Yeah. Right. I mean, I think it's just something that, that I, I'm grateful that there's been more conversation about it. Yeah, absolutely. And one of our key things that has always been from Food Share's perspective is like, we want people to be in a position where they can make their own choices about food yeah. and have the resources available for them uh, to do it. So if you're like, we want people to buy their own food, right? And we want communities to have ownership over the what's available in their community and what that looks like. Um, so we've never really been, this is the first time we've actually done free food uh, for communities. We've never run a food bank. We've always done things that people could buy um, and that they had control over what's, you know, being made available in their in their community. So that's always been pretty foundational to what we do. Yeah, yeah. You talk about empowerment, right? Um, I'm grateful. You, I mean, geez, we we could talk for another hour about the politics of food. Um, we do have people that are yes, that are people people are appearing to uh, to apply for jobs uh, with Food Share in real time. Justin Evans on Twitter um, says here, you know, I I really want to work at Food Share. Where do I sign up? Jespo, I mean, at least Justin knows that if there is a job posting, he's going to know what what salary he might make, so he knows Absolutely. he can start yeah. there. Um, Katie, give us something to think about on, on our way out here. I mean, when when, it, when, it, when we talk about the politics of food, maybe what we better do is is bring you back here as part of a roundtable and dedicate an hour to that. But but give us something to think. We always ask for 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 something to walk with and something to chew on, something to ruminate on over the next number of days. The politics of food. The politics of food. I think um, charity will not ever 
fix food insecurity and charity is not a solution uh, to poverty or food insecurity. And I think that a lot of charities will tell you that they're working on fixing food insecurity and they can't. Um, and charities often actually make food insecurity worse because they make governments and us, the people, uh, think that something's being done about food insecurity that's tangible. And the reality is that it's a stopgap, uh, temporary, um, inadequate measure, and that what we need to fix food insecurity is fix income and fix systemic racism. And until we do those two things, we can give as much as we want to food banks, um, and it won't move the needle even a little bit on food insecurity. It's income and it's race. Katie German is a programs director at Food Share, a, a nonprofit out of Toronto, focused obviously on, as you've heard, food justice. Encourage you to check out the hashtag show the salary and give Food Share TO a follow on Twitter. I have so enjoyed this conversation. I'm wired in a strange way where ever since I was nine years old, sitting around my grandparents' Sunday dinner table, we always loved conversations that pushed us to think outside of our parameters, pushed us to think outside of our long held beliefs. And, and, and I suspect that that's probably oftentimes the case in your work place with a bunch of change makers as we call yeah. them katie thank you for your time oh that's great i love chatting and i'd love to come back you bet well consider the door wide open and we'll look forward great. to that <laughs> sarah hoyles is already i know you're probably already dreaming stuff up uh we're dreaming up ideas on on the politics of food i'm trying to think because you know we never want to have the formula a terrible formula a losing formula for round tables is to get three voices where everybody agrees oh you're right you're right so oh, I yeah agree oh I, I agree with them i couldn't have said it better myself yeah, oh exactly. nightmare so we'll have to find different angles but i think that there's many di I'm, I'm intrigued we'll get we'll get the wheels turning here and that's something um uh, i'm really i'm really grateful for that conversation conversation with katie that's excellent agree with everything she said or not boy has she given us a lot to think about i i think i could dig in a few i mean the, the, the whole employer and the posted salary thing i do think there are concerns where employers would say this isn't necessarily 100 percent realistic um it depends on the position you're hiring for too and i love the point she makes about you know education not always relevant experience not always relevant sometimes it is mm -hmm. right we need somebody like i think of like homer simpson working at the nuclear plant sometimes you want somebody a little bit more you know you don't feel that Homer was qualified? Oh, I just, I mean, you gotta love Homer. God bless him, but I'm oh, not sure. Oh, things are gonna to, blow up here. Yeah, things are gonna blow up. Just like sales are blowing up on the 2021 Jeep lineup at St. Albert and Sherwood Dodge. As a matter of fact, in all seriousness, the best selection when it comes to the off-road utility brand that's been trusted around the world since 1941. I'm driving that Grand Cherokee right now. Just had it out in the woods last weekend. Of course, I respected it and took care of it. Don't worry, everybody. But I'll tell you, there's nothing like a Jeep to get you and your loved ones out into the great outdoors. They've got that brand new Grand Wagoneer. It's back. I think of uh, What About Bob, Richard Dreyfus driving around in his wood-paneled Grand Wagoneer. Well, this thing has been reinvented. Escalade, schmescalade. The Grand Wagoneer touching down at St. Albert and Sherwood Dodge. You can check out their inventory online. Just follow the links under the Sponsors tab at ryanjesperson.com. Of course, tell them Jespo sent you when you go in there to pick up your brand new Jeep. Check this out. I love this tweet from Lisa. Lisa's a real talker. As a matter of fact, Lisa's even rocking her Real Talk Ryan Jesperson t-shirt at a girl, Lisa. She says, I went to Dairy Queen here in, in Calgary tonight in my Real Talk shirt, and I was very upset when I was offered zero deals, no promotions. She says, I'm a bit jealous of you North Edmonton Sherwood Park folks getting all the deals, but I think my city might be prettier than yours she says i'm open to photos well thems are fighting words lisa but we can tell you this nothing looks better than a real talker crushing a blizzard in their real talk t-shirt of course you know that the teams at dairy queens of northwest edmonton and sherwood park right now offering five dollars off the father's day ice cream cakes get dad the dairy queen cake he wants for Father's Day, five bucks off at the Palisades, Nemeo, Newcastle, Westmount, Y Gardens, and Baseline Road locations. If you mention Jespo or Real Talk, plus they're taking donations for the Stollery Children's Hospital Foundation. So the Jespo recommendation, aside from the cake itself, take that five bucks you save and send it to the Hospital Foundation. 
The team at Friesen Brothers also getting you set for Father's Day. They've got these Father's Day barbecue boxes. They've got you covered from their famous sourdough cinnamon buns in the morning all the way through the day as you celebrate Dad, including some fabulous Alberta beef and veg to throw on the grill. But keep in mind... Friesen Brothers, in addition to those Father's Day boxes in Fort Saskatchewan, Stony Plain, and Edmonton, call ahead of time or go online for details. They've got BC cherries in their 16 stores across the province. There's nothing like fresh BC cherries, and you'll find them at Friesen Brothers, Alberta grown, Alberta owned for more than 65 years. Sarah Hoyles, of course, the editorial producer of this show, is oftentimes keeping an eye on news that develops as we're live via RyanJesperson.com. Thanks to everybody that's subscribing to us on YouTube, subscribing to our podcast, and, of course, smashing that like button. It appears as though the Lotto Vax is getting even bigger and better. Take us into the details, Sarah. What's going on? (laughs) Are we getting... Like a kickbacks on this if we're advertising the greatest summer ever giveaway. Lotto if the Alberta Vax. government starts advertising on real talk, I think that the <laughs> the veil in the back of the church is gonna tear in half. But what's going on here with the Lotto Vax? So they've bumped up the prizes. Okay. So August draw prizes from WestJet. So you can get a vacation package for two to Cancun. And it's a uh, round trip economy flights and seven night all inclusive stay. So okay. that's that's August giveaways. And how many trips up for grabs? I saw somebody, one of our real talkers on on the chat, said that there were forty trips up. For, is this true? So that's there's that one vacation package, and there's one voucher for two people to fly round trip. There's ten vouchers for two people to fly round trip. Yeah. There's three giveaways of fifteen. $100 WestJet dollars, and then five giveaways of WestJet reward gold status. So that's just August. And that's uh, that's for WestJet. And then they have Air Canada prizes S- and similar similar type of thing. So, but yeah, and also to Cancun. And uh, I'm surprised they didn't, you know, try to get trips to Hawaii, but. Well, I mean, yeah, except for <laughs> the whole WestJet thing is like, and again, this is going to come back into the way that the referendum vote goes, right? Are you pro-Alberta or are you anti-Alberta? Yeah. And a lot of people were through the course of that Aloha Gate from December into really all hell broke loose in January and January into February. A lot of people were saying, well, this is a government that's basically going to do anything it can to protect. I mean, Jason Kenney spelled it out. Premier Kenney spelled it out about WestJet. The worst thing that could happen would be for WestJet to fail. Nobody's cheering for WestJet to fail. No, don't get me wrong here. But there is that interesting relationship. Uh, perceived or otherwise, and I would suggest it's otherwise, uh, the relationship between that airline and this provincial government. So optically, I think some people will probably say, hang on a second, what's this again with the Alberta government promoting WestJet, this, that, and the other? At the same time, I'd love to win a WestJet trip somewhere. I'm fine. What do you think the first thing was that I did after we got off the air yesterday? I signed up for the lottery. Did you? I, oh, yeah. I mean, I, I, are you kidding me? Wouldn't you? A million dollars? On principle, you not signing up? I mean, my odds are better if you don't, so please don't. Yeah, but. I, I'm i torn. I haven't signed up yet. Why? I, I'm i just, I'm undecided. I, I'm not, I'm not sure yet. Okay, so if Alberta could eliminate its deficit with a sales tax, but we don't have a sales tax, and you think it would be healthier to eliminate the deficit, are you going to start voluntarily paying sales tax? <laughs> I mean, just because there's policy you don't agree with doesn't mean you shouldn't capitalize on it and take advantage of it. Nobody's paying more income tax than they're required to pay, are they? No, I just, I, I don't know. I, this is where, like, I'm, I'm just, I'm on the fence about it. I'm also just, I guess I was going to like, I have to put all my personal information into there, but I'm like, but they already have it. So really, I, I signed up. It's, it's, it's your name, your address and your date of birth. That's all it is. Yeah. You know, um, and an email address, right? Yeah, your email. I mean, the government has all that. Oh, yeah, I know. You know, no. I don't know. I just, I, I'm not sure yet. And I know that people are like, it's a, it's a million dollars. But to your point, if I don't, you're welcome. Yeah, I mean, I would, ra- I would, quite frankly, I would rather you not sign up. Number one, my chances of winning are better. Number two, if you win a million dollars, I'm not sure how long. See, a million dollars, it's like it's a. It, we may lose our producer. Yeah. We, we just got you in here. Yeah. Uh, so I'm not really looking for you to win a million dollars. I will say, though, if I win a million dollars, I'm still showing up to work. Right. If I win five million, peace out, everybody. Thanks for the memories. 
Uh, 10 million, you will never hear from me or see me again. Social media wiped, website down and done. Uh, but 1 million, depending on where you are, your stage in life, 1 million is transformative wealth, mm. but it's not really job quitting wealth, is it? Not I mean, anymore. I mean, unless you're 65, at, at which point, you know, or 60, and then you go, I, I've got some RSPs already, and I think that this million bucks bumps me up, and now I can have that ski boat I always wanted. Um, but at the same time, you know, you're, you're in your 20s, 30s, 40s, early 50s. I don't know that a million bucks is like, go take a pee on the boss's desk. I don't think a million bucks puts you in that territory. I, I really don't think so. Like, do you remember like game shows where they're like one million dollars? It was like, whoa, that's that's incredible. Now it's just kind of like, OK, that's a good cushion. Yeah, it's a good cushion. It's a nice little cushion. Yeah. Um, so, you know, uh, yeah, I, I would say that the few, the fewer Albertans that sign up for the lottery, the better for me. Uh, but <laughs> <laughs> but as long as the government's offering it. Why not? I'm going to throw my name in the hat. People are also wondering about, and, and, and let me just say, because it's called real talk, real talk. People are going, you think this lottery can be trusted? Well, I've, and like, like you Ryan honestly, Jesperson's name comes like, across, they're going to be like, yeah, that guy definitely <laughs> you wins. Think? Yeah. Like, who's going to win it? Yeah. Who, who, who optically would be the worst? Ryan Jesperson. No, <laughs> Maybe. <laughs> I'm just joking. Yeah. Get, get me canned and then give me the golden parachute. Yeah. That would actually be quite, that would be quite generous. But I don't know. I mean, you know, I would I would hope that this you get the sense and I don't know. I'm just running my mouth here. I want to be careful because I don't want to say the wrong thing. And we treat this platform responsibly. And I'm not going to put speculative stuff out there that people are going to, you know, take. And then they go to the kids soccer game and start talking about, oh, I heard it on Real Talk. But you get the sense that the way that this was rolled out, that maybe there wasn't proper consultation with like, for you know, and someone said, by the way, first of all, it should be called a lot a, a raffle. Not a lottery. People aren't necessarily buying tickets. It's a little bit of a different structure. But is this being administered by the AGLC? Is this, you know, who is the governing body overseeing this? Who is ensuring that the information is protected? Who is doing is conducting the draw? How are we ensured that you know, ensuring that the draw has integrity? Is it truly a random draw? I mean, many people have many questions. And quite frankly, I'm not sure that you can blame people for questioning the validity or the integrity of this based on some of the other observations that people have made about this government. Is that a fair statement? I think it's a pretty fair statement. So I don't blame people, some people, for questioning the validity of this and whether or not it, you know, it's even worth signing up if they didn't make a donation to this party. And that is precisely why i'm on the fence yeah. why i'm like mm, i'll i'm uh, yeah the issues yeah. managers would love to have a field day with my most recent comments but then they'd have to they'd have to confess that they watch and listen to real talk <laughs> so <laughs> what a conundrum what a conundrum what to do what, what to, to do. do what are we looking at for tomorrow tomorrow oh my goodness i'm, I'm looking forward to this police presence at pride yes so we oh. have uh we have Pride Toronto will be on the show with us. They've actually banned police presence, uniformed police uh, at Pride. So we're going to be looking at that. I know New York City just uh, decided they're going to do a uh, two to four year just kind of like pause. Mm. Um, we'll also be speaking with a Calgary police officer. Uh, Tad about, Millamine. That's right. I'm so grateful he's agreed to come back. Yeah. So. We last talked to him on Pink Shirt Day. This is before you were here. Yep. Um, Tad Millamine is, is an out- gay uh, Calgary police officer who's done remarkable work on anti-bullying initiatives. I'll be curious for his perspective on this. Tad, uh, I should say Constable Millmine. That's right. Get it right. He came on the show a while ago, and, and I was thinking that I was throwing him this heater, right? I mean, I, I'm like, here, <laughs> here comes this pitch that there's no way that this guy's going to know how to handle. I said, what do you make of this movement to defund the police? He says, I think it's a great idea. And I'm like, gulp. <laughs> Okay, go on. Yeah. And we told him that we look forward to our next conversation, and that's going to be tomorrow. Uh, that's a great booking on your part. Nice one. So that's coming up on Friday. We're going to be taking a look at city design, in particular parking. There's a lot still to come here. In the meantime, we want to remind you, we're really, really looking to have more than a 1,000 responses to our question of the week this week. It's going to be based on, not based on, I mean, it's inspired by the question everybody's expecting, this referendum question on the municipal ballot this fall. RyanJesperson.com is where you will find our Get Real question of the week it takes two minutes to answer and we want to know what you make 
We're asking you literally the exact question we're expecting to see this fall. It's very simple. That presented by our partners at Y Station, our official research and strategy partners. The team at Kubi Energy wants to remind you that in addition to presenting positive reflections every week here on Real Talk, they're also installing commercial, residential, and industrial solar projects across Western Canada right now. They're based out of Edmonton and Kamloops. They've got teams that are traveling all over the place, helping people better understand how sustainable energy can benefit them from small installations all the way up to the massive ones. I was talking to Jake at Kubi Energy just a short time ago, and he was telling me about some really creative collaborations they're doing with businesses that approach them and simply ask open-mindedly, what do you think we might be able to do? They're inspired by the green energy trend. They understand that economically it can be beneficial and Jake and his team are doing a great job helping them understand. You can look and find more at kubienergy.ca. Again, all of our partners under the Sponsors tab at ryanjesperson.com. Same goes with the team at Eden Landscaping. They're, they're never busier than they are this time of year. I was talking to Mike a short time ago at Eden Landscaping. He says, you know what? He says there's so many people that have been staring out their windows winter into spring, just dreaming about what they want to do. But let's be honest. Life comes at you fast. you got a whole bunch on the go. And, and quite frankly, what do people like us know about building safe retaining walls or actually making interlocking brick look like it's supposed to if you're like me the answer is zilch that's why you go to the professionals you paint the picture they make it happen they've been doing it for more than 20 years check out the good work that they've been doing at landscapeedmonton.ca that's the team at eden landscaping and finally i can't believe we're already halfway through the week the benefits of a long weekend. We're just two days away from Friday's show, which means that we're buckling up and bracing ourselves for another rowdy edition of Trash Talk. If there's something you've got to get off your chest inspired by this show or otherwise, send us an email to talk at ryanjesperson.com. Keep it quick, keep it punchy, and subject line, Trash Talk. Local Waste has been providing a heads up to entrepreneurs and business owners across the province that some shady dealings going on right now. A new company's on the lands trying to, I don't know, mislead, even trick people, allegedly, into signing on to new contract extensions that are not beneficial for the business. Local Waste has sniffed it out, and they're looking to help you there. Give them a shout at localwaste.ca. Boy, has this morning ever flown. We're going to make sure that we rebook our guests to talk about this lying down movement in China, the lying flat. It's it's Chinese youth pushing back against long-held cultural beliefs. A fascinating insight there. If you missed anything on today's show or were inspired by something and want to see it again, you know where to find us on YouTube, on the podcast. Thanks for all your support. We'll talk to you soon.